Hey, good morning. Welcome to the uh, HPC COE uh, workshop within the HyPeak conference. Um, I believe that the, the most famous saying in 2020 was, can you hear me? I'm not going to say that. I'm assuming that the participants can hear us and, and we'll be able to see our screen. I'm going to start sc um, sharing my screen now. Um, which you should all be able to see. And um, I'll go into full screen mode there and explain a little bit about what's going to happen in the workshop. So I've got some information for the attendees. Um, and then I'm, I'll, I'll go over the agenda and then give start with the first presentation about the Focus CUE um, project. So this, this workshop is about HPC Center of Excellence Services and Applications. We have some information for, for, for you, the attendees. This workshop will be recorded and the videos will be uploaded onto the HiPeak uh, YouTube channel. You can follow the conference updates using the hashtag HiPeak21. There will be some tweets sent out um, about the workshop via the um, Focus CUE um, Twitter account. Afterwards, the presentations will be uploaded onto the events page. What we're going to do is take your questions after each of the individual presentations, after each speaker, and you can, um, there are a couple of ways you can um, send in questions. You can actually use the chat option to spend, send questions to either just to the speakers or, or the speakers to all attendees, or there's a Zoom question and answer option at the bottom of, of, the, of the Zoom screen. Otherwise, um, you've got the option to raise your hand and, and we have um, Renata Jimenez um, helping us out on this. So she will, she will be able to handle any of your questions. So we have a fairly busy agenda. We've got um, a number of presentations starting with a quick introduction to the Focus CUE CSA and then multiple talks from the CUEs. Um, we've then got um, a coffee break and a final CUE presentation before we have a panel looking at the questions around co-design. So without further ado, I will give you um, a quick introduction to the Focus CUE um, con um, CSA, um, Coordination Support Action for the CUEs, and it's about concerted action for the European HPC Centres of Excellence. This is a quick um, overview of the consortium, a couple of organizations you may not know, all the rest are, will be well known to you, uh, well established players in the HPC communities. You probably don't know Scarpers, that's a small SME and we're the coordinator of this CSA. And Terratech is, is also an organization that many of you will know, um, but that's more like an SME and an association promoting use of HPC. Otherwise we have quite a lot of HPC centers and a lot of HPC expertise in the project. What the Focus CUE, uh, Focus CUE CSA is all about um, is to support the HPC Centres of Excellence in taking their role in what, at least when we put the project together, were three pillars um, of the ecosystem. The, the Euro HPC joint undertaking and the, and the European HPC initiative is really pushing ahead in three areas. On the one side, you've got the technologies. So that's represented by the likes of ETP for HPC and the EPI processor in initiative. Then in infrastructure with Prey and Gion. And of course, behind that, all the, the, the move towards European exascale systems. And then without which nothing really makes sense, you have the applications. So really they're, they're a, a core activity within the ecosystem because without the applications, you've just got boxes with flashing lights. We've got a lot of various, a, a number of um, COEs involved. Some of them brought in in 2020 and I'll give you a quick introduction to those centers of excellence. Not all of them will be presenting um, at this workshop today, um, but there's a lot more information on, on the website that you'll find later. So the first, the, there was a first wave of centers of excellence um, prior to the, the more recent um, wave. The second wave was launched in 2018, 19 at the same time as Focus with a number of um, COEs here with a, a range of applications. One of them, ECAM was 
was continued from the first wave. So they're looking at electronic structure and quantum dynamics. Um, but then we have a range of, of, of um, projects and you'll hear about some of them. So we'll, you'll hear about BioXL, Cheese, uh, EOCE, Hidalgo and Accelerat um, and Comp Biomed. But you've got biomolecular research, research in solid earth, energy, weather and climate, engineering, global challenges, materials design, there's more on that coming up. One, one CUE that's a bit more um, horizontal, if you like, is, is POP, looking at performance optimization productivity across applications, um, and then Comp Biomed Biomedical. Some of those themes have been extended or added to in, in the new uh, um, wave of series launched in 2020. Um, four of them already active. The fifth one, AIC, is still, I believe, in contract negotiation. So there's no web page for them yet, just yet. Um, but there's some new themes there. So looking at combustion, novel materials, also in the material science area, personalized medicine, and computational chemistry with, with T-Rex. And then the new the newer one is combining AI technologies with simulation-based engineering. So simulation meets AI for engineering applications. The focus CSA um, has three, uh, has a four main activities, more objectives, and I'll introduce those um, briefly. The, the first is to actually give a um, um, strategy platform for the COEs, and that's been set up, called, it's called the HPC COE Council, HPC3. And then we are supporting the COEs in their interaction with industry, um, complementing the training activities of, of PRACE and all the COEs um, by making that more visible what, what the CUEs are doing in the training area. And then we're there to promote the HPC CUE brand and, and not the focus CUE brand. So all of this supports our central objective to, to make, to realize their place in the ecosystem. So the HPC3 um, council was set up um, in May, 2019. It's very active, all the centers of excellence are involved, and it's about promoting the whole set of activities of, of centers of excellence, not just individual ones, um, and looking ahead for how HPC COEs can be, became, become sustainable. And of course, one of the, the key activities to uh, allow us to expand the interaction with the overall HPC ecosystem and the other players in the, and the other pillars I mentioned. The approach for industrial interaction is to promote the services and competences that, that the sets of uh, COEs have um, and going out to industrial events. Now that's been impacted by, by the um, corona pandemic, of course, but we have already had some success stories um, with making it clear what sort of industrial collaborations the COEs can have, uh, making contacts to industry through, through events. Um, increasingly, we'll be moving towards virtual events. There's a lot of training being offered by um, various COEs um, and Focus COE is trying to look at what, what's the push for the more training and education across applications areas. So we had a, a training stakeholder workshop in, in 2019. Um, we're trying to promote and make available a, a source for people to find all the training being offered. And we're also offering transversal training to the series themselves on, on a range of topics like um, business development or pedagogy or co-design exascale development. Finally, we've got a set of activities promoting the, the brand of the CUEs, promoting the successes that the CUEs are having, um, letting people know what's out there. And um, we obviously, again, because of Corona, we've been moving to more virtual events and webinars as opposed to just representation at conferences. So that's all I, I want to say about the, the, the Focus CUE CSA. The, there is a website that, where you can find all the information about all of the centers of excellence, um, also about Focus, but um, there's a lot of material there. There's newsletters, links to the, to the various projects, information about all of the CUEs. So there's a lot more information you can find at that URL there. So with that, I would end slightly early. Um, 
And if there are any questions, I'd, I'd take them now. Renata, then you... No, for the moment, we don't have any questions, not okay. on the chat and not also on the on the question and answers. So I guess we can then give the floor to the next speaker. Okay. So our next speaker is Nick Brown from um, EPCC. I need to end my presentation and um, make sure that you can give up the, the screen. Renata, can you? Can you stop sharing? Um, no, I did the wrong thing. I'm looking you should have for a button bo that said that reads "Stop sharing." Okay. Apologies for this hitch here. This version of Zoom, Zoom doesn't seem to let me do that. Are you able to um, handle that, Renata? Uh, no, unfortunately, you have to kind of stop sharing. Um... Can you not? So I, is Nick then the next Nick, speaker? Nick, can you Nick try Brown? and start, start presenting? Exactly. Yeah, I tried. Unfortunately, I can't share while you're sharing, it says. Exactly. So is do you not have this button to yeah, stop sharing? Was, for me, it was at the bottom of the screen. Exactly. The at the bottom button. of the screen? Yeah, it, it's not showing up at all. You don't have a stop, short, stop button? I can try video. I can stop video. That, that's but I can't. I can't stop the. Nope. Strange. What I, what I can do is is leave and then rejoin. And that should that should probably do it. But I don't even have that. Um, I, for the participants, I, I really apologize for this. I don't know what happened with the combination. Ah, okay, got it. It was on a different computer. Okay, so Nick, okay, so then Nick we'll hand over to the next speaker, Nick Brown from uh, EPCC. Um, and he's representing the CUE Accelerate. And he's going to be talking about FPGAs and scientific computers computing and presumably in the context of the Accelerate COE. Okay, over to you, Nick. All right, thanks, Guy. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully you can see my slides okay. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about the Accelerate um, Center of Excellence. And the whole idea of the COE is to accelerate engineering codes to make them ready for future exascale machines. Now, we've got... Um, six reference applications that we're really focusing on. And these represent some of the grand challenges when it comes to engineering codes in Europe and in the wider world as well. But we're not just limited to these. The idea being the techniques and the technologies developed, we can then apply to a whole wider raft of codes out there that people can come to us and ask for our expertise on. So I think these are really interesting. And there's a whole bunch of different organizations involved with the center of excellence. We've got the partners on the left and then um, sort of affiliated organizations, if you like, on the right, who are involved and, and interested within, with the formation of interest groups. Now, what really excites me about the center of excellence and the work we're doing is based upon the ambition of these engineering codes of these applications if we can develop the underlying technologies and techniques, absolutely, we can fill an exascale machine. But obviously the question is how we go about doing that. And there's lots of different pieces in the jigsaw that make up that overarching capability. And what I really wanted to do with this session 
is sort of drive, drive this with an illustration from my own area, something I'm looking at here, really to give you an idea of some of the questions we're asking, some of the capabilities that we're looking at building up um, with this goal of the engineering codes in mind. And the specific question I'm looking at here is, okay, these future exascale machines, they'll definitely have CPUs, they'll definitely have GPUs. I don't think anybody in the audience would argue there, but what other technologies, what other hardware might fit in here? And specifically, what about FPGAs? You know, what benefits can these bring to our engineering codes that as a whole, the center of excellence is looking at popping on these X scale machines in the future? This is my little bit that I want to briefly deep dive on to give you a flavor of some of the things we're doing. And I think personally, what this is looking at, what this is trying to solve is for me, the memory bound nature of some of our codes. Because if we profile some of our codes in the sense of excellence, they are to some extent at least limited by how quickly we can shovel that data into the um, compute units of the hardware. And potentially this is where FPGAs are gonna give us some nice benefits because not only do we have massive bandwidth to the outside world, but also we've got this massive concurrency on the chip. So we're thinking, look, can we make a difference here for our applications by having part of the chip do our compute and other parts of the chip, for instance, reading in data, reordering it and making it available to this compute. But also, again, forward looking to the exascale machines, there's some really exciting hardware developments coming online this year. Um, a prime example being this Versal architecture, which has loads of these AI engines, which will accelerate fixed points and also single precision floating point arithmetic. Again, looking at making codes ready to be able to answer whether this is going to be playing a crucial role for some of these in the coming years. So what, just to give you an example, we focused on here and some work we've just finished is one of our applications called NEC 5000. We are specifically looking at this in the context of wind turbines. So, you know, that blade spinning and the air coming off it and all the interactions there and the efficiencies there. And you've probably heard of this. It's a very, very common application. And also it's associated proxy app, Neckbone is also very, very famous. And when we profiled this, it was a pretty depressing story. You can see here from Intel VTune on the right, the vast majority of the cycles are actually wasted on waiting on memory. We're only getting about a quarter of the overall cycles that are doing useful work. So actually, if we can fix this, we can get a massive capability improvement in this code and potentially you know, address some of the, um, the, the engineering challenges that are being asked of us. It's actually even more depressing than this because when we are looking at scaling this on a single CPU core, we're hitting memory bandwidth limits really, really quickly. And um, on 24 cores of this Xeon Platinum, we're only going about 12 times faster than one core and we're completely maxing out our memory bandwidth. So really looking at these challenges to solve and we've got lots and lots and lots of them throughout the COE. Now, what we did here is we focused on a specific kernel of this proxy app, which was causing us all the challenges. And for all our different elements, we've got about 800,000 double precision floating point operations that we want to keep fed with data and we want to keep continually running. And as I say, my specific question here is, can this technology help and can it have a future for these engineering codes in these future supercomputers? And you know what we did is we converted this into a C++, which is fairly simple, and then decorated it, which is needed for FPGAs, and popped it onto the architecture. And I think you know what's really interesting with these different explorations is the initial version we got based upon the CPU code was terrible. You know, it's something like 3,000 times slower than just running on that CPU. But that's because we'd not tuned it for the architecture. And by changing the code and tuning it, making it much more data flow, we got massive speed up. I mean, down here, just at the single kernel perspective, I think this is something like 4,000 times faster on the FPGA than our initial version. And a single kernel, and we'll talk about multiple kernels in a second, then beating 
a CPU in terms of the performance. So interesting within this code, but also more generally, we think the techniques and the ideas that we are developing and exploring here have a, a wide application within HPC and within these engineering codes more generally. And on the left, just very, very briefly, um, these are just some of the outputs from the tools that absolutely you can use if you know what you're doing, but then it's building up that knowledge and experience and really seeing where that works well from us from a software perspective and where there are some disconnects and then having discussions with the vendors um, and trying to feed it around in co-design for that. Now, what we ended up with in terms of this specific code was this kernel here where in order to get data feeding through and all the different bits of our kernel running concurrently, we have three different phases where the current element of data in the middle here is operating, but then the next element is being read in and reordered. And then the previous element is down here operating because some of the data from the current element then has to be reordered. So it's about sort of playing these different games, looking at all these different ways in which we can get this maximal performance. And here, you know, making every cycle count, not losing over half of our cycles due to memory stores. Something else that we found really, really helpful here in the context of this application and some of our other applications is the performance predictability as well. Because, you know, let's be honest, on a CPU or a GPU, if I look at the code, I've often got very little idea about the exact performance I'm going to get until I actually run it. But that's not the case here, because it's transparent about how it's actually going to get onto the hardware. So, for instance, I know each of these matrix multiplications will give me 31 floating point operations per cycle. This thing in the middle gives me 17. So I can do some very simple maths and actually come up with a realistic sort of theoretical level of performance that I should be matching with my kernels. And we again find this a very useful way of thinking about the problem and thinking about if our performance is acceptable or not. And you know, just to step back for a moment in terms of the performance, we could get four of these FPGA kernels on the actual FPGA, and we compared it for this engineering um, use case against the CPU and the GPU. And what you can see is we're absolutely beating hands down this Eon Platinum, even with one FPGA kernel, but certainly with four of them, and drawing you know, a tiny, tiny amount of power compared with it. Um, the GPU is still doing better than us. We're only about 70% of the performance of the GPU for this engineering code, but we are drawing, you know, less than half, well, a bit less than half of the power and almost double energy efficiency here. So it really depends on what you're looking at and what metrics you're looking at. But we found in the COE, you know, it's very useful to build up all this knowledge, build up this understanding of our applications, how we present this, how we present the hardware and the techniques to really come up with some of the answers that we are asking in the community is asking of us. And as I say, this is of the current generation FPGAs getting around the memory bottlenecks. And we think the next generation with these AI engines and on the Intel side, the tensor cores will be very, very helpful and potentially could be a game changer in terms of closing this gap. Now to step back to the actual CRE, as I say, this is one piece of the jigsaw about a whole load of other things that we're doing from data analytics to workflows to techniques running at, um, at scale to IO. And you know, lots of different teams with lots of different expertise, further developing these, tuning them to the codes and answering some of the questions that I've sort of illustrated today with my own area of interest here. So thank you very much for listening. I suppose there's two sides to this. The first side is, you know, on the novel architectures, on the FPGAs and the hardware itself. You know, I think that's really exciting. I think there's certainly going to be quite a bit in the future about this. And actually in High Peak this week, we've seen quite a few different bits and pieces um, developing here. And then more generally on the COE, lots and lots of things going on, lots of services that we're offering to the community more widely to engineers more widely, which people can sign up to on our website. 
and the website at the bottom of the slide where you can gain more information. So thank you very much for listening. And if there's any questions, please, um, please ask. I'm more than happy to answer them. Okay, so I cannot see any questions. I on see the Edouard chat. has a question. Yeah, I have a hello, everyone. I have a question and a, a comment. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, so, in uh, the first uh, echo one, we had uh, refactored uh, a molecular dynamic code. Um, and uh, now it was part of a, a next project with this Exa2 Pro, which was uh, specifically on uh, porting on FPGA. And so we had the result a bit similar to what you show, uh, performance uh, which were close to the one uh, of, the, of a single CPU. Um, so I have uh, and a comment. So, and we were, but we had a really a great improvement on uh, energy consumption. For the same result, we have a 60, uh, in 60 time improvement in energy consumption. And also something you did not mention, I, wa I was wondering if you are using it. On FPGA, you can really choose the size of the number you use, the number of bits with, which are used to encode the real numbers. And uh, on this specific, so it might be very specific, we could use uh, 40 bits instead of 64 which made a, maybe a five time. I mean, it was a great improvement in performance and also greatly helped uh, the energy consumption. So I was wondering if you had uh, tested this and using a multiple precision of a, an FPGA, which is uh, really easy to do and can gain a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I suppose the two, so absolutely. And I suppose the two comments is I completely agree. And to some extent, it depends on what your what you're interested in, in terms of, I think the performance, the, sorry, the power saving is hugely important. And, you know, it's this combination with the performance that potentially is so exciting for us. It's actually really interesting what you said in terms of the precision. Um, I, we've tried it. I've not seen the same um, uh, benefits of it. Certainly going to single precision, going to half precision, we don't actually save any resources. And in some cases, we increase the latency of the operations for this specific code. Um, going to fixed point, we do have a saving. It's about 30% you know, saving. So it's not massive, massive, massive. Um, I guess it depends very much on the code itself, but sort of my thinking is these next generation AI engines where you really are you know, accelerating these lower precision and fixed point operations could potentially be a game changer. But I guess it's very, very application specific and um, from one application to another, exactly what it's gonna be giving you. But very interesting that it made a much bigger difference from your perspective. I was, I was a little bit disappointed, but for our specific code. Okay, with an eye on the clock, I'd like to thank Nick for the presentation again. Um, would like to then to move on to our next uh, presentation. So we will actually stay with Edouard, uh, Edouard D um, from CEA, who's the coordinator of the um, EOCA project. And he's gonna be talking about renewable energy in the exascale era. So over to you, Edouard. Hello again, everyone. Can you see my presentation? Yes, could you go into full screen? Yeah, super. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so as Guy mentioned, thank you Guy for the introduction. I am uh, the coordinator of the EOCOE. So EOCOE stands for Energy Oriented Center of Excellence. And I'm going to present uh, broadly our uh, activity and what HPC can do for uh, renewable energy. So first, a slide of uh, introduction. Uh, so as you know, SPC is going a uh, major change and we saw with the previous presentation uh, using FPGA and there are other exciting devices. So there is a, a lot of change uh, in uh, hardware and this will uh, pose a numerous uh, challenge. Uh, so we need a hundredfold reduction in energy consumption. Uh, we need a very 
massively parallel computing model to use uh, millions of uh, computing elements. And we will probably have to deal with a very heterogeneous computing nodes and with the deep memory hierarchy. Uh, so we all know that this transition to exascale will require a really a radical innovation in computing technology, uh, both for uh, hardware and, uh, and, and software. Uh, on the other side, so more the left side on my slide, uh, there is also a, an energy revolution going on and uh, in principle, a renewable energy could power the, the world. Uh, so you have here a, a little sketch of uh, energy sources with the surface of the circles being the amount of uh, energy available. Um, so you have the little brown dots there on the, on the left hand side, which is uh, the the yearly use of energy worldwide. And so the large circle is the solar energy that we receive. And then you have various sources of renewable energy, tide, geothermal, hydro energy, biomass, uh, wind, the big green circle here. And then on the right side of the graph, you have all the, uh, I would say, carbonated energy with uh, natural gas, petroleum, coal, and uh, nuclear energy with uranium. So you can see if you can get a significant fraction of the solar energy, of wind energy, or other things, you can easily provide uh, enough uh, energy uh, to power the, the world. And that's what we are working on in ECHO. We are uh, really trying to to use the power of supercomputer to help uh, making this transition to a low carbonated, reliable uh, energy. Uh, so we are at the crossroad of these two revolutions, uh, numerical and the energy revolution, and try to, to combine these. So, trying to switch to the next slide. too fast okay so uh, echo uh, general function it's uh, a project with uh, seven country 18 partners we have a 13 research institute so you can see them on the on the map here four university and uh, one sme which is uh, participating and so guy mentioned that there were several rounds on uh, of coe so we had echo one on the first round of coe and now we have uh, another uh, three years, so it's, it's quite a, a large uh, project, and we hope we can have uh, a next round and participate to, to the next round of, uh, of COE when it, when it comes out. The idea is that application development takes a, a long time, and we really need to have a, a stable structure and stable collaboration to carry on with the application development. Um, so ECHO is organized uh, around the scientific and technical challenge. I will show you a map later. So in, uh, these are the scientific challenge. So I, as you, I so show you before, there is a wide diversity of uh, renewable energy sources and we are really targeting only uh, five of them. So the first, uh, first one is wind for energy. So we are working on uh, optimizing turbine placement to maximize power output and uh, reduce uh, maintenance. And so there's a lot of issue with the complex terrain, with wake from other turbines and things like that. And the idea is to help the European industry to be more competitive by reducing the cost of wind for energy. So making it uh, cheaper and uh, really a competitive energy source. So for that, we are doing both research and also working with uh, energy provider like uh, Iberdrola. So this is a collaboration carried out by the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. We, another key aspect is metrology for energy. Uh, so the idea is to have uh, enhanced resilience of power market to variability and extreme events. So this is a, a key issue. Uh, the problem with renewable is that they are not uh, predictable, they are very intermittent. And if you want to couple them safely to the grid, it's really valuable to, to be able to assess the variability and especially uh, extreme event, which could uh, uh, end up in a breakdown of the full electric system. So people are very scared of that. And it's very important to be able to predict this uh, extreme event. 
uh, and this is used for the power management of the system for a given site location. And there again, so it's more carried out at uh, the Ulysse Supercomputing Center. There is connection with uh, people who are actually doing electricity trading. Uh, the next aspect is a material for energy. So here it's we're trying to increase the performance and extension lifetime of uh, organic and uh, silicon solar cells and uh, also uh, trying to work on uh, supercapacitors and, uh, and batteries. Um, so for this field, we're also very much linked to other COEs like Max or ECAM who are working for the, in energy. So we share common code and try to, to work together. And the idea is really to improve the performance of this uh, device. Uh, the one before last topic is water for energy. Uh, here we do a very high resolution simulation uh, to really be able to manage and have prediction for the efficient management of uh, hydropower. And that's one aspect. And the other aspect being uh, trying to model uh, optimal configuration for uh, geothermal plants. And uh, we are actually modelizing uh, actual uh, geothermal uh, installation. And the last one is fusion for energy. So we are making a simulation to contribute to the success of the ITER. So it's a large tokamak that is uh, being built at the south of French. So it's a large uh, worldwide project. And the idea is to try to shorten the, the time to market of uh, this kind of uh, energy. Uh, so for each of the scientific uh, objective challenge, we have very clear scientific objectives. There's a, a very strong societal and energy impact for uh, each this challenge. And we are working for each of these applications. We have a flagship code, and we are working on a on real application that goes into production and not on, a, on mini apps. And so uh, we have a, a technical uh, challenge also in the in the project. And this technical challenge are the actual uh, work package actually of the project. I believe it's really the, the key issue to, to reach exascale. So uh, each of the challenge tackle a, a very important bottleneck for our application and has also a, a, a much wider scope. I think it's problematic that it can be encountered in a, a wide variety of code. Oh, so the first technical challenge is a programming model. So to have a good performance, scalability, a proper code architecture. And also the key idea is, is to have a performance. As we saw in the previous talk, there is a, a large variety of hardware, different uh, hardware that could be used. And so we want the code to, to be prepared for all the hardware that are present today, but also, uh, I mean, code development is a long endeavor, so we want this code to be available for, for a long time, so to have a flexible programming mechanism that allow you to be performant on a future architecture. We have one more solver, so linear algebra, which is a, a key building block to many applications. Uh, the next technical challenge is a data flow. So I think it's uh, very important. Uh, HPC is uh, more and more uh, data centric and data flow is a key issue uh, for many applications. Uh, this goes to in-situ data analysis, uh, IO, or uh, complex, um, complex workflows that involve the data treatment. And the last one is uh, ensemble run. Uh, so the idea is to use exascale machine to run a very large number of a smaller size, I mean, still big, but smaller size simulation and to do in-situ data analysis. Uh, and this is very useful, for example, for uh, weather, forecast or weather forecast or hydrology application. Uh, so as I said, all these challenges are really dedicated to work with our application. And we also provide tools that could be used, tools and methodologies that could be used by a wider community. Um, so as I said, just a small side to see how we try to turn Exascale into benefit. So really try to work on the application and uh, improve the performance and the HPC readiness of each application. And we don't use mini apps because mini apps, of course, it's much easier to, to reach Exascale. Uh, but then I think the impact and the usefulness of the application is much lower and sometimes it's uh, hard to ramp up 
uh, from the mini app and to put back all the physics to have a, a proper uh, application uh, to be used. Uh, so we are really always working on uh, on real application and put back what we do on uh, in uh, the production repository for the application. Um, so Flagchico, so this is how the project is organized. So uh, all the color box are one is one of our scientific challenge. Uh, horizontally, you have our technical challenge, and you can see all the dots represent the, the interaction. Uh, so in each box, there is really a high impact scientific case and applications that will be ready to use on the upcoming exascale architecture and each have a specific bottleneck that you can see here. So you can see there is a, a lot of things that are shared between application and a lot of problematics that are shared, even though uh, they are in a very different code and very different uh, physics behind. Uh, just to give you a, a view, so this is our uh, flagship application. You have here the scalability on score. So we have application which most of the time uh, are already uh, quite uh, performant. They can use and scale scale up very well on on each cores, and you can see the identified bottleneck here that we are trying to solve with a very strong uh, collaboration between the, I mean, more HPC people or uh, computer science people and science people to really uh, bring uh, forward the the application. Um, so to try to have more impact, we have also a long-term collaboration with the EERA, which is the Ener European Energy Research Alliance, which is one of uh, really many key players in uh, energy uh, in Europe. With uh, I think there's uh, about 50,000 researchers affiliated with the uh, EERA, uh, and uh, EERA is organized into a joint program. Uh, you have all the joint program uh, there, and we have just, uh, so discussion has been going on for a long time with EERA, and we have just established a new transversal joint program on digitalization for energy, uh, which has two sub program one dedicated to HPC and one dedicated to data science, both for energy. And you can- well, see two minute warning. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and you can see that many joint programs are uh, already wanting to, to work with us, with uh, Green Ticks. And so EERA will be really, uh, and this collaboration with EERA, a great way to really spread the HPC and data science culture through the a very large uh, energy-oriented uh, community of, uh, of researchers. Uh, another thing that we do to return to the community is to implement a SAS portal. Uh, so that's really to give access to our application to people which are not very familiar with HPC and to showcase our application. Um, so we have two applications now which are integrated first, so uh, Parflow and uh, Alia. And the code are uh, installed and uh, and the portal is uh, implemented at uh, PSNC, so the Polish Computing Center, and it's actually uh, their, uh, their development. Uh, so you can see the portal is now up and running, and it's uh, really meant to be a showcase of echo and probabilitor of other applications if other uh, COE or other people are interested uh, to showcase their application share. And the idea is not to have a, a that people pay to use the application. It's more to showcase the application, attract new users, and foster collaboration, and especially with, uh, with industry. And so I will conclude. So I think HPC is a key asset for many energy applications and can really help and foster the energy transition. Uh, on the opposite, I think the energy is a key societal challenge, and it could be one of the incentives to develop large HPC system, which, as you know, will be very costly. So you need an important thing to, to do with them. Uh, ECHO, uh, we have several applications which are ready for exascale system, and we hope to have a, a larger impact through the energy sector, especially through our collaboration with the uh, EERA. And I will stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Edouard. I, we don't really have a time for a question, but um, Renata, is there any urgent question from the chat? No. 
Okay. So we can yeah. then we can maybe come back to some topics later in in the in the panel. So thank you very much, Edouard. Yeah. And I'd like to pass on now to um, Arno Walsh from BSC. He's the coordinator of the Cheese CUE. And from re renewable energy, we're now moving to earth science. So over to you, Arno. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hope you can see the screen now. Okay. Yes, everything's fine. Perfect. So we move uh, to cheese now. Uh, cheese is a center of excellence for uh, the built in the realm of solid earth. And in particular, on, on, we focus on natural hazards, on different typologies of natural hazards, on, on earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, tsunamis, and, and uh, the earth magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And today, my idea is to give a quick overview on the different uh, service typologies that we are developing and implementing in, in cheese. Uh, cheese is a consortium of uh, 13 partners from uh, seven different countries, and we have a, a variety of, of uh, partners. Uh, from uh, supercomputing centers, we have also academia, uh, institutions that uh, have uh, operational mandates, and then a couple of, of private companies. Uh, we have like uh, four high level objectives, uh, which are application, science, services, and community building. In terms of applications, the goal is to prepare, we are preparing uh, 10 different open source uh, community codes uh, for the upcoming uh, pre exascale and exascale machines. But uh, because most of us, we are also science, scientists, uh, we also want to use the codes to address what we identify at, at the beginning of the project as uh, relevant uh, exascale computational challenges in our, in our domain, in our community. Uh, then we use uh, the codes together with the series of workflows that we are developing to implement what we call pilot demonstrators. And we are dealing with 12 pilot demonstration demonstrators that, uh, are intended to uh, enable to test uh, future operational services oriented to diff different aspects or critical aspects of uh, geohazards. Uh, I'm going to focus on this third objective today, but we have another another important one, which is community building, building in which uh, we are trying to uh, integrate around uh, HPC and HPD8, a uh, variety of research institution, academia, industry, and very specially uh, civil protection agencies and public governance bodies <clears throat> uh, integrating around uh, HPC. And this, of course, this, this objective includes also uh, training. Oh, sorry. So, as I said, we have uh, 10 uh, flagship codes on four different areas. On, well, we have four codes on computational seismology, uh, two codes on magneto hydrodynamics two more on physical volcanology, and two more on modeling of uh, tsunamis. Uh, the level of this code when we started the project was quite heterogeneous in the sense that we had uh, the computational seismology community, which was uh, already, which had a long, a long, a long track record in, in, in HPC. So those codes were already at uh, a level of beta scale. It means that when we started the project, uh, they uh, were already had a good scalability performance at uh, thousand, ten thousands of, of, of cores, whereas other, co other codes from, from other communities uh, were not at, at that level. No? So we divided, we classified the codes on, in these three different levels. And the strategy uh, has been uh, the following. When we started the project, we did the first uh, audit uh, of the codes uh, in collaboration with the POP Center of Excellence. And from the results of this uh, first audit, we applied a series of code optimizations at many different levels, from <coughs> intra or internet optimizations. Uh, we implemented in many codes that inhabit a thread parallelism, optimization of, moment, of memory, uh, porting to GPUs in several of the codes, uh, mitigation, mitigating uh, load balance issues, fault tolerance, etc. Producing uh, parallel uh, asynchronous uh, for I/O operations, uh, we did a lot of effort also on, on scheduling and workflow managing, etc. And after that uh, first, uh, let's say, uh, series of optimizations, we have now done a second audit run with Pop in order to have uh, comparative metrics, and we can evaluate the progress of the project by using the Pop the Pop metrics as as an indicator. And from that, we are now starting a second phase in which we are doing a further optimization of the codes with the objective of uh, 
decreasing the level that I was mentioning before by at least one point. Uh, we, also, we are also doing uh, an important uh, part of uh, code design. Uh, we have mini apps for four of the codes that uh, some partners are using to implement a specific uh, code optimizations. So, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to focus today on services. And as I said, uh, we have 12 uh, pilot demonstrators. Uh, and eight of those, these pilots uh, will become uh, service candidates. We also have uh, other pilots that uh, will stay at a lower uh, TRL, technology readiness level. And those are, by, by the moment, not yet uh, service candidates. But we have eight service candidates on four different uh, technologies of services. We have uh, three pilots that focus on origin computing. Uh, we have other three that focus on probabilistic hazard assessment for earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, and volcanoes. Another one that targets at early warning of tsunamis. And another one that targets at uh, seismic tomography. So I'm going to give a quick overview of, uh, of these uh, pilots. Uh, what I want to highlight, and it's, it's very important, that we are doing this in a strong collaboration with uh, the industry and a user board. So we have a, a long uh, <coughs> a board of uh, users that is uh, permanently growing. We have uh, 25 now. Uh, and these are um, companies, associations, uh, civil protection agencies, etc. That are, we are um, somehow uh, co developing uh, different pilots uh, together with uh, the IOB members. So, uh, uh, the first uh, pilot is uh, urgent seismic simulation. Uh, and the idea here is to use uh, urgent uh, use, uh, supercomputers to get uh, very fast uh, ground shaking maps after an earthquake has occurred. So, we have here a workflow that uh, is able to retrieve uh, the occurrence of an earthquake. Uh, does an automatic determination of the focal mechanisms of the earthquake, and then uses some uh, IE intelligence uh, layer to decide in a clever way whether this is uh, potentially uh, relevant to uh, trigger <coughs> or to run this on a, on a, on a supercomputer and to continue the workflow. Uh, this is intended to be as a future service uh, access through EuroHPC. And uh, the idea is to give, as I said, uh, physics-based ground shaking maps, which uh, would, would suppose a significant improvement with respect to the current uh, simplified ground motion prediction equations. Uh, we are implementing this in several areas, and we have these cases on, on southern Iceland and in Turkey and also in, in Mexico. Another service uh, topology is the faster than real-time tsunami simulations. Here is similar to the, the previous one, but uh, with tsunamis. And the idea here is to get extremely fast and robust uh, tsunami simulations using um, tsunami high sea and plants like high sea, which are two of our flagship codes. Again, here we have an automatic retrieval of uh, airport information just after the earthquake has happened. And this is sent to, to the system to run on the fly uh, tsunami simulations. This service is already operational. It means that it has already been integrated uh, in the EU Emergency Response Coordination Center, which federates different um, civil protection agencies uh, across Europe, and it's integrated in, in, in Aristotle. So this service is already working. And uh, the pilot, uh, apart from, from Europe, we also have, have it in, under test at several regions, like in, in Japan, in the Western Mediterranean, or, or in, in the Pacific. Another one is uh, the physics-based uh, uh, seismic hazard assessment. Here, I didn't mention, but uh, an important point for us is to, um, when we deal with natural hazards, we have a lot of uncertainties. So an important point is uh, to use uh, supercomputing um, super to run many ensemble members that take into account all the variety and all the possible range of the scenarios that uh, may happen. So here, the idea is to run many, many simulations using this uh, physics-based model, which are the state of the art, and then combine them to give a probabilistic solution with uncertainty quantification. Uh, so here, for uh, in the case of uh, seismic, for example, the potential uh, service users are EPOS or, or the geological surveys or insurance companies, nuclear power plants, et cetera. 
And we are implementing uh, three test cases here, two in Iceland, one in the north, uh, northern Iceland seismic zone and one in the south, and uh, another one in Turkey. But here we use uh, CyberShake, which is a collaboration with, uh, <coughs> with uh, the Southern California Earthquake Center that has been ported for the first time in Europe. Uh, another one uh, related also to um, uh, computational seismology, seismic tomography. And here, the idea is to use a workflow to run also many thousands of simulations to solve an inverse problem, which uh, allows uh, solving uh, the full forward inversion and to get uh, an idea of uh, <coughs> the subsurface properties. And the, we are trying to do, to do this up to 15 hertz. This is a very, very high resolution. It means that you can have a very, very detailed uh, image of the subsurface. And we are testing this in, in different areas, in the Pyrenees and in the Northern Seas, in the Northern Sea. And finally, uh, we have another one for volcanic eruptions. Uh, the idea here is to run an ensemble of uh, simulations of uh, volcanic ash and aerosol dispersal that combines uh, the full 3D model with uh, satellite retrieval. So uh, it's an ensemble based with uh, data simulation. And here the target is uh, to cover Europe at a uh, few kilometer resolution, which this is much, much finer than the current operational uh, systems that we have in place in Europe and all over the world. And uh, we will run to run, uh, this pilot runs with uh, several tens of ensemble members uh, to account for the different uncertainties that uh, we have uh, when the volcano is erupting. So, uh, in, in, all, in all the cases, I want to say that uh, we have been uh, coordinating effort to include uh, several aspects, such as the definition of uh, the TRL, the TRLS for, for the chief services. Uh, we have put a lot of effort also to define the functional requirements, such as uh, the, the time in virtual computing modes, uh, the resolution that the end user requires, etc. I know two and, minute warning. Yeah, I'm finishing and uh, how this is validating. Uh, it is also important to define which are the policies for accessing, as accessing the, the future HPC resources, uh, the computing time, the storage space, et cetera, uh, the IP protection uh, that we want to protect it, but making, compact, making it compatible with uh, the principles of open science. And finally, in, in some of the cases, particularly in urgent computing and early warning, it's particularly important to pay attention to uh, uh, social responsibility and liability aspects. Uh, this is, is critical, uh, who uh, should have access to our results, how and under which conditions, and how is the dissemination of these results. Um, I think I'm done. I just want to thank all the people that is working in, in cheese and that is making this, uh, this project uh, possible. Thank you. Thank you, Arno. Renata, any questions? Any hands up? No, no for the moment. No. Any questions from the speakers to Arnau? Maybe I had one, but perhaps the next presentation will, will answer it. I think for this like urgent computing issue, this may be an mm -hmm. overlap between Hidalgo and Cheese. Mm -hmm. As you want, we can answer later or now. Oh, no, that's mm -hmm. my question for you. Is do you see other overlaps with with other um, COEs like Hidalgo? Uh, probably with Hidalgo, yes. I would like to hear from uh, from from them, from Javier. Uh, yeah, I mean we are not doing any any particular collaboration in this regard. Okay. Uh, Okay. And maybe I can just also say a few words. So, for example, we are not doing urgent computing right now. You know, it would be possible, but I mean, it's not something that we are doing. Uh, and the kind of problems we are addressing right now are a bit different. So, somehow, um, things that, they, that are addressed in cheese are potentially also some global challenges, let's say, that are not exactly the same ones that we are addressing. Okay. 
Okay. So I will show you now. Yeah. There is one question just came in on the chat. Um, for the earthquake case, uh, Arno, the question is, do you get instant access to HPC facilities? Since usually manual access is needed. So how do you uh, address that? Well, right now, no, but this is the idea. Yes, the idea is that uh, uh, we would like to define some kind of agreement in the future with Euro HPC so that when we run in urgent computing mode and when the, there is some earthquake which is sufficient uh, of a sufficient relevance you stop the machine and you get access to uh, i want to say the full machine but to a substantial part of the machine with a high priority yeah, and you have to kill all the all the jobs that are running there and also we want to do this with redundancy in the sense that we would like to run not only in one machine but in two ways Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Then we pass over to Javier. Um, Javier um, Nito is going to, from Atos, who's the coordinator of the Hidalgo project. And um, he's going to talk about the combination of HPC and big data technologies for global systems. Off to you, Javier. Okay, now can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, can you go into full screen mode? Okay. Yeah, super, thank you. Okay, so good morning everyone. As I said, I'm uh, Francisco Javier Nieto from Atos. I'm the coordinator of Hidalgo, which is the center of excellence um, for um, global challenges, okay, in which uh, we apply HPC for global challenges. Um, so yes, uh, uh, um, quick overview about the objectives and motivation of the project. So basically, we see that there are some challenges in general in the world. It could be just a small, uh, a small place in, uh, in which there is some issue that is repeated among the world, or uh, yes, challenges which are affecting very big areas, um, uh, like for example, migration or the COVID-19 recently, as, you, as, you, <laughs> as we all are experiencing. Um, so this is the kind of problem that we are addressing here in Hidalgo. And uh, what we propose is to use HPC technologies, HPDA, artificial intelligence, in order to uh, propose solutions, okay? So in the end, the idea of the project is just to uh, develop the tools that will be necessary in order to do simulations and in order to support the decision-making. Um, that is uh, addressing these global challenges. Um, then you go through uh, tools that are, um, we analyze the state of the art, we do uh, also benchmarks uh, with respect to uh, HPDA tools, uh, agent-based simulation tools, other simulation tools as well, ready to uh, CFD, for example. And uh, we also aim at creating some community around these kind of problems. Uh, so uh, we, the idea is that we contact several people that uh, will need our support in order to solve this problem. So uh, actually I will tell you later about that the associate uh, partners program as well. Okay, so just to give a few examples of the kind of things that we do, um, I will go through the pilots of, uh, one of them is the uh, migration. So basically uh, we do simulations when some conflict is happening, then people uh, tend to move to other countries, uh, because they are running away of the problems. So uh, the idea is uh, that we do simulations on how these people is moving in order to predict where they are going to be and where some head somehow uh, should, be, should be brought, you know, just to support people. And also the idea is to investigate what happens when some uh, uh, measurements are applied. So for example, a country is closing the border. So how is that going to affect people? Um, or for example, we are coupling these with weather simulations as well. So what happens when there are just, for example, a lot of rain, uh, so people need maybe to change their, their directions and so on, okay. Uh, another one is related to uh, social networks. So basically, uh, we understand that uh, yeah, you all know that nowadays uh, people is using social networks a lot and they use it uh, just to get to be, to be informed and to express their opinions and things like this. And in some cases, uh, there are really attacks uh, <laughs> just using the social networks, right? People manipulating uh, fake news, or maybe what you want to do is just to advertise some products, some new product, and you want to make it viral, things like this. So we, we, um, 
do simulations in order to understand how the messages are spread in the social networks and which kind of measures, uh, measurements, countermeasures could be applied in case that we you want to stop uh, fake news, for example, or just to some kind of messages. Another one is a runner pollution simulation. Uh, so this is a good example of, uh, of something that, hap that happens in a very concrete place. So it's basically cities, but this is repeated in many cities in the world. So somehow it's also a global challenge. Uh, in this case, what we do is uh, we simulate the traffic with the basic simulations, then we simulate the, the pollution emissions because of that. And coupling that with the CFD simulations of the wind going through the streets, uh, also coupling that with weather simulations. So what happens when it's raining? What happens when it's windy? When What happens when there is no wind at all? Uh, so we see in which uh, parts of the city uh, you have too much pollution accumulated and it's possible to do different simulations in order to apply some kind of countermeasures and see what will happen, for example, if you close this street to the traffic or um, do good enabling all the routes for the cars or things like this. And because of the COVID-19 outbreak, so when all this happened, we said, okay, uh, this looks like a real global challenge, so we should do something. So um, last year, uh, we started to prepare simulations of COVID-19 uh, spread, okay? So basically what we do is we simulate how people is moving um, through a certain area. It could be a neighbor, a city, for example. And uh, we determine according to the, um, to the uh, characteristics of the, of the disease and, and the different behavior of the people, uh, when people get infected and how that could affect them. Uh, and in the end, what we obtain is some graphs in which you, you can see if you expect uh, that people will need to go to the hospital, how much people in time, uh, or even how many people could be uh, just dying okay, because of that. And the idea is that we can apply um, different countermeasures as well. So for example, you could decide just to apply some uh, curfew uh, in the city to, uh, during 15 days in order to see how the simulation goes late after that, or yes, for example, to uh, request people to um, do teleworking and things like this, or you, you can close only schools or you can close only uh, restaurants and things like this, and then see how, how things evolve. Okay. So uh, in order to do that, uh, what we do is um, we work in different codes, uh, mainly uh, agent-based uh, simulations uh, with, uh, with these two codes, for example, FLEA and FAX. FLEA is more focused on the part of migration. FAX is focused for the part of, of COVID-19, for example. They are different because, I mean, we're talking about different scales. Um, also, we have typical simulation tools, uh, for example, a HIST in order to uh, reconstruct the social networks and spread uh, and see how messages are spread. Um, we use tools like OpenFoam for, uh, as well, for example, in the case of urban air pollution to stimulate that part of how the pollution is moving uh, because of the wind. Uh, and of course we use HPDA. So we do different things. Uh, we, we have been doing several benchmarks in identifying bottlenecks. Uh, we, we have seen, for example, um, several ways to improve in terms of input output operations, especially with agent-based simulations. Uh, we are applying new architectures uh, and, and, for example, accelerators. Now we are uh, running some code on GPUs for the urban air pollution. Um, uh, we have been playing with optimization with, for the, with the configuration in order to optimize the execution. And one of the things that we want to do uh, in, the, in the near future is to, to see how to support uh, the European processor initiative, for example. Uh, migrating maybe some small code in order to, to see how we could benefit from uh, that kind of hardware that we suspected to, to, to be present in exascale systems in the future. So, um, of course, we also work um, in the part of workflows. Um, so we have the typical HPC tasks together with other tasks uh, like moving the data, doing HPDA, publishing data somewhere, preparing the data for visualization, things like this. Uh, so we have tools that facilitate this with some orchestration mechanism that is able to connect to different HPC systems, uh, supporting Slurm, supporting Torque, also supporting different cloud um, solutions whenever it's necessary, because we see that at some point, okay, you, you need to, to run the hard part of the simulation in the HPC system, but maybe there are other um, um, 
tasks ready to, to uh, post processing and visualization that could be done in a cloud environment, for example, just uh, being trying to be more efficient using the resources. Also, another point with, that is important for us is coupled simulations. So, as, as I've mentioned before, so we are coupling simulations of the people moving in migration with the weather. This is also applicable to urban air pollution. Um, uh, we are uh, also not doing coupling uh, with um, data streams uh, related to, for example, the sensors data in the city or um, telecommunications data that could be uh, interesting for the migration part as well. So we foresee different ways of coupling, uh, weak coupling, hard coupling. So um, different things that uh, different, yeah, different topics that we are investigating, and uh, we are using tools such as FabST, Muscle Two, in order to, to enable that. So, but the services that we provide is a center of excellence. So you can see that we have basically six main uh, areas. Um, I will go quickly through them. So in terms of, cons of consultancy, what we foresee is that, okay, we have the part of expertise, which has to do with, we have this experience with the with the use cases, we have uh, this experience with the tools as well, so we can do things for you. So you can we can tell you how to use them for uh, some problem that you have. We can uh, support you how to configure and use things. And we can also uh, do further developments in, in case you need something from, uh, you need to implement something to be implemented for your problem. And also the part of solutions. So basically you came with a problem and then we, we could um, just design the full solution for you and at some point even implement it. Um, or even uh, adapt some solution in order to, to fit with your problem. Um, with the speak of training and community building, um, we have different uh, training activities. So we participate in, in uh, European training events, but also we organize training events. So for example, we did this with the uh, Adama University there in Ethiopia. And uh, of course we can do uh, things like that in, in, in other contexts and in other places. Uh, and we also provide a, a tool uh, for online courses. So we have Moodle and we have already published three other courses um, uh, for example, on how to use some of the tools or how to uh, how they yes, explain how some of the use cases work and uh, how they can be used. Okay, we have defined uh, two clear training tracks. One uh, focused on the global challenges part, uh, which is okay. Uh, we can solve this kind of problem. This is what we have done so far. This is how you can use our tools in order to solve a problem in global in the global challenges part. And then there is the HPC HPDA track, which is much more technical and it's mainly for developers who want to understand and to know uh, how to use uh, HPC technologies in order to solve problems. Then, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, as part of the community, we have set up in place a, um, an associated partners program. So the idea is to um, have a strong relationship with the external entities to our project. This could be uh, other projects or also stakeholders. Uh, we already have several partners. Uh, I just mentioned here a few of them. So these ones are also already part of the of this partners program. Uh, so projects like Beg, Maxer, DC Ways, Yukui, Odysseus. And we also have ongoing collaborations with our stakeholders. So right now we have a close collaboration with Save the Children, uh, with respect to migration, to Bosch, uh, with respect to run air pollution and simulations for the traffic. And we also have one another one in place, which is with a, an a Spanish hospital in order to do the COVID-19 simulations. Avi, a two minute warning. Okay. Um, then we have the part of user support. So basically what we have done is to set up, uh, to, to just put in place several tools that are uh, that can be used by users to be in touch with us. Uh, the idea is to uh, provide support in terms of, um, uh, well, first of all, express support. So you can send us a ticket and do concrete questions so we could answer you and um, solve any problem that you may have, or at least to try. And the other one is a kind of open forum in which people can be publishing their questions and other people could be answering. Uh, also experts from the project could be answering in those questions. So that, that is openly available for everybody. And we also have uh, some uh, wiki with the uh, documentation uh, about our tools and the project and, all, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, as uh, for co-design, 
Um, we foresee two different uh, types of co-design. So first of all, software to software, then how about, how about to software. So the idea with the first one is that the, there are um, new versions of the libraries uh, or even new libraries. And uh, we're interested in uh, taking a look at how that affects uh, our codes or how our codes could be improved if we are using these new features of the, of the new libraries. On the other hand, we have the part of the hardware in which you may have new architectures. Um, and what you want to do is uh, to see how your code behaves, how you can optimize your code, and also you can see the bottlenecks and also talk to the to the people in charge of that in order to tell them, look, uh, when you have this and that, we are trying with our code to do this and we have this kind of problem or we can benefit uh, a bit better if you, I mean, if the Hara could do this and that, okay. Then uh, we have repositories. So it's possible to, to store some data in our uh, repositories. We also have a data catalog, so it's uh, easy to access and, and navigate through the data that is available. And a code repository, so uh, there is a prototyping environment with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And additionally, this Git repository with the uh, continuous integration and, and deployment tools. And finally, uh, well, uh, we have a, a portal, uh, which is a one-stop shop for accessing the tools. So basically we'll put things together, all the things uh, you can enter there and execute, uh, execute your applications uh, through our orchestrator. So you don't need to, to directly um, deal with the command line for sending your jobs. Uh, you can find there the, the, the access to the data catalog and data management tools. You can access there to visualization tools, to the support tools. And uh, yeah, so we are integrating a lot, a lot of things there. And the idea is that it will be uh, public, uh, it will have a public access at the beginning of March as we are doing some refactoring. And that's all from my side. So we have now some questions. Thank you, Javier. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat and because we are on a quite tight schedule, um, what we could do is ask questions in the coffee break, I guess. So with that, thanks again for your presentation and uh, we'll move on to the next presentation, which is Rossen uh, Apostolov from uh, KTH um, and he's coordinating the BioXL COE. So we're moving from global systems now to life sciences. Over to you, Rossen. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, uh, an overview of how how we meet user needs uh, in HPC in the life science uh, domain. BioXL COE is focusing on a small subset of the of the very large life sciences uh, um, area. We work on biomolecular research, looking into uh, modeling. Uh, biological molecules, DNA, proteins, etc. Uh, what I'm going to present now actually in terms of uh, why, what and how we, uh, it, we do services in life sciences, it's actually applicable to uh, to the broader area of life sciences. And as we've seen from the other applications, there's a lot of overlap with what uh, in other domains is being done. Uh, so uh, what, just one example of, uh, of the, the work that uh, we've done in the center and what we are able to do is uh, for example, something which is very relevant, particularly now in the COVID uh, pandemic, is, is a very uh, quick and fast uh, computational search for, uh, for drugs. Uh, and, and what we have developed and are using in the center allows us to, uh, to extremely rapidly uh, scan through uh, a, a large number of uh, molecules to identify potential drug candidates, uh, do this uh, at a to close to pre-exascale, exascale level, pushing the limits in a production run. But uh, what, what is our main goal as a center uh, of excellence is, is that ideally any researcher should be able to do similar work easily and fast. So uh, we as center should uh, help the, the wider community to do all of these uh, large scale modelings uh, quickly and uh, easily. So the three fundamental needs of uh, the users, if, if we can uh, structure them like that, is that they need the tools to, to do such type of uh, research. 
um, they need the expertise how to use them because those are very powerful applications uh, used in a in complex uh, uh, environment for complex um, uh, cases. So they need this uh, advanced expertise, but also they need the resources uh, to do that. Um, and, and we try to address as much as possible uh, these three different levels. Uh, so for that to, to be useful to the communities, uh, we need to provide a comprehensive service portfolio. And what uh, we are uh, you know, developing in Bauxa, the, the way we structure uh, the work in providing services to communities, uh, we develop uh, solutions uh, in terms of uh, code or, or like small uh, tools that do specific steps of, uh, to help solve a, a given scientific problem. Uh, and as, as we know, these are uh, to be useful, they need to, to be coupled with other applications. So workflows are, are fundamental as we've seen in, in the other presentations on the other series. Uh, so you need the workflows to package everything uh, and uh, be able to execute this on a, on a large scale compute resource. Uh, then training and consultancy addresses the, the need to uh, um, increase the competence in the communities and help them make better use of this. And then uh, HPC package offerings where you, you couple these uh, solutions or workflows with the training with access to HPC resources. Um, a quick overview of the, some of the main applications that uh, we have in the uh, in BioXL. Uh, one of them is uh, Gromox, which is a very popular application for molecular dynamic simulations, which lets you model at a twistic level uh, the dynamics uh, of uh, bi biological molecules and soft matter in, in general. It's been also used for uh, non life science applications. Uh, Haddock is uh, another application which uh, lets you to integrate experimental data or, or other types of computational data into modeling when you try to uh, to dock to uh, combine different molecules and see how they interact. Hybrid uh, quantum mechanical molecular mechanics simulations using CP2 care are fundamental for understanding, for example, enzymatic re uh, reactions. Uh, free energy calculations is very important. It's a very powerful and widely used tool uh, our uh, application PMX uh, uh, does that, that uh, allows you to understand how strongly certain molecules can bind with other, uh, which is very important for uh, designing uh, and new drugs and screening of libraries. And uh, we also, uh, we work with several workflow platforms. One of them is uh, BioXL building blocks, which lets you mix and match uh, different tools to, for your specific problem. And all of these codes are already featured on the EU Innovation Radar. They're of very high quality. Um, another way of delivering services through just one example of uh, different portals that uh, we offer is we have portal with, through which you can access the data, even do some uh, analysis of through a, a web interface. Uh, Going to the uh, tr training needs, uh, we we are developing a we're working with a very comprehensive training program, which uh, actually looks at the needed competencies for for different user profiles. Say you are a, a beginner, or maybe you are a experimentalist who is just starting now with computational uh, uh, research, and uh, we we know what kind of uh, uh, knowledge you need to uh, to have in order to do your work. So we, we map these competencies to specific training and uh, point to relevant resources. And we organize all sorts of uh, training events to address these uh, uh, needs for building competencies. And another one is support and consultancy, which is uh, which goes uh, in bigger depth. It's uh, more uh, uh, engaged on a, 
uh, on, on a smaller scale for in-depth, such as in-depth support to build competence building, site visits to, uh, for example, to uh, co commercial companies, pharma companies, tailored training, depending on the needs of the, uh, of the groups, uh, certain software customization, we know that there is no one application that solves all the questions, and, uh, and very uh, um, uh, large selection of tutorials, best practice guides, webinar series. Uh, a few examples of uh, some of the services that are very popular uh, since the very beginning, we started webinar series, which uh, are uh, growing in uh, number. We have going on maybe over 50 or 60 already. Uh, and this has been an excellent way to uh, to record and share uh, knowledge with the wider communities. Um, another one is uh, providing community forums. So we have ask.byxl.eu where each of our applications and tools has a category. Uh, now the added value, uh, one added value of doing it that way is that now that multiple applications are routinely needed and used to solve specific uh, scientific questions, uh, it is very valuable that, that you get support with all of them within the same uh, uh, place, that because you, you would often need to uh, help from uh, different, for different parts of your uh, uh, computational uh, work. So having uh, those applications under the same form of umbrella is uh, uh, very beneficial and helps also for the community to, to help uh, each other, the, the members. Um, so somewhat uh, recently, we, we also launched uh, documentation space, .bioxl.eu, where we collect uh, a lot of the best practice guides, tutorials, uh, and uh, more material, which is going to be further developed, uh, will be growing and will be populated further. So we, we need to make access to such information uh, uh, easily findable by the by the members so that they can uh, make better use of it. Um, so for for those who are um, who are watching this and uh, are working in this area, I, I would encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. It's a once a month, uh, offers highlights of uh, upcoming interesting events and uh, some success stories, and uh, it's been a good way to keep an eye of what we offer as, uh, as support and services uh, and it will be useful for your work. Um, yes, so that's from me. I try to be quick. So if there's some questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks a lot, Rossen. So we're slightly ahead of time. Well, only two minutes, um, but we've two minutes time for, for any yeah. questions that might come up. Yeah, I try to be on time. Mm -hmm. Well, if something comes up later, I'll, you can always reach me and uh, I'll be happy to follow up. Yeah, yeah as we said earlier, the, the slides will be made available so people yes. will be able to follow up with mm -hmm. the slides. Um, okay, I don't see anything from the from the chat questions. Then, um, Renat, I would suggest that we take a, two minutes more of the, for the coffee break and that we come back um, at um, 11.30. Fine, perfect. Okay. I'll set up a time then now. Okay, good. Okay, so see you in 30 minutes then. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.
Marco, we're a couple of minutes early, so I suggest we wait until it's uh, eleven thirty. Okay. Yes, perfect. Uh, should I try to share the presentation? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, then I'm happy to welcome everybody back to the, um, the second session of this workshop. Um, our final speaker before the um, panel discussion is Marco Vediccio from SurfSara, who's um, representing the Comp Biomed COE, or Comp Biomed 2, perhaps, which he'll probably explain. And he's talking about um, HBC services for the biomedical community. So over to you, yes. Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Guy, for the introduction, and thanks uh, for the organizer of this uh, very nice workshop. Um, as I said, um, my name is Marco Verdicchio. I'm a HPC consultant at SURF, and I'm here to represent and to uh, give you an overview of the activities we work in the Combiomed uh, Center of Excellence. Um, the Combiomed uh, works uh, for uh, to support and promote modeling and simulation activities within the biomedical community, uh, mainly focusing on uh, three uh, um, macro areas, cardiovascular medicine, neuromuscular skeletal medicine, and molecular-based uh, uh, medicine. Uh, the focus of the, the, the project the research and the, the application um, goes uh, across all the scale of biomedical science. So for, from molecular uh, systems up to organs and eventually to simulate uh, full human. Uh, being a, a high performance computing center of excellence, the, the, the scope of the, the, the activities of the project are also focused on uh, the development and of sustainable software tools and services and map them to uh, the uh, uh, needed computational resources can be cloud or high performance computing. And, uh, the partner is the, the, the project is indeed uh, um, um, made of different type of partners going from academic partners to clinical and industrial partners, both big industry and SMEs, uh, and also supercomputing centers are in the project. In the, the second phase of, uh, of the COEs, uh, or the, where there are also two international partners, two US partner, Arco National Laboratory and Rutgers that are collaborating with the core partner in the project to develop uh, research and uh, uh, applications. But the network of uh, Combiomed is also go outside of just the core partners. We have a very good uh, and extends, extended network of associate partners. Even also here, we have a, a mix of academic research institutes, supercomputing center, cloud provider, and industrial partners and SMEs who are working together with the core partner in the project to, to again, to, to uh, develop a biomedical solution and, and promote uh, modeling in, the, in this community. All the work also done within the project uh, get, got um, a lot of help and support also from collaboration with other uh, initiative, European initiative also represented here this morning in this, in this workshop, other projects. Uh, and a lot of the services I'm gonna uh, show you, a lot of the activities we, we, we worked on were indeed the collaborations between Combiomed and other, other projects uh, funded within EU. So uh, what are the uh, main objectives of, of the project? So to, to also uh, have a, a look at the uh, service-oriented perspective of, of, of the a consortium. As I said, Combiomed is a user-driven center of excellence, and we have also uh, an heterogeneous type of community, including academy, industry, SMEs, and especially clinical sector. So uh, the, the idea, the goals and the objective is to work with the Combiomed applications 
uh, to support the, develop, the development of, of these codes, especially toward the uh, access scale, to have access scale ready biomedical application and workflows. Also promoting and, and making easier the access to high performance computing system and, and data data services and in this we have a large part of the effort in the project that is works to improve the the use of uh, hpc system and cloud computing system and uh, integrate and manage the resources uh, offered by combiomet partner or access by the combiomet partner all of this work we plan to we we are working to translate this work into real services that can be used by the end users. So we are working both in maintaining, create and deliver uh, a service portfolio that is indeed community driven, so uh, dictated by the, the needs of, of our end users, and in trying to coordinate these with other user community, other projects that can indeed be complementary in a lot of the activities and, and work done across the different projects. Um, as I said, the, the role of the communities that we, we try to support and help here is, is, is essential. And uh, given the, the different type of communities that Combiomed uh, is, is interfacing with, we have different kind of support and services and, and really different targets that we have with the uh, community. So we go from uh, academic user with, with we have a lot of uh, relationship with uh, research, uh, trainings, development of code, and really promoting and use the, the services and results of the project. Industrial and clinical part and clinical users and partners that have different needs, mostly trainings and or incubator services, all support to actually access environment like HPC that are not very uh, common in, in, for example, clinical practice. And we go up to the general public with a lot of uh, uh, dissemination and community building activities where there the, the most of our work is to, to, to increase the awareness around the projects like Combiomed and activities like in silico trials or, or uh, compute modeling and computational simulation in the biomedical domain. Um, uh, starting from, from this last point, Combiomed has, from the beginning, it worked uh, extensively to, to um, in build a, a strong community, and we started with uh, an intensive online presence of the, of the project. The Combiomed website is the main uh, uh, reference point for, for external and internal user who wants to know more about the project, access the services, that we develop and, and have updates on the, the latest news. Uh, the project has also a very active uh, Twitter account and LinkedIn account that you can you can follow you can look up following the links that I show here. Uh, we have also a YouTube uh, page, uh, Computational Biomedicine, which is used. Uh, to host uh, some the videos of meetings and, and trainings. And there you can also find one of our biggest dissemination work, the Virtual Humans uh, film that has been shown already uh, in several uh, scientific and not uh, type of events. Uh, the community building passed also through the organization of meetings uh, last year for, for very well known uh, causes were not possible to have any in, um, in person meetings, but we kept organizing online events. Uh, again, on the website, you can find many of uh, many more information of the events organized and planned in the future. One of the major events we organized in 2019 was a Combiomed conference, a three day conference, uh, very successful, and that we are trying to, to replicate in 2021, of course, in an uh, uh, unfortunately, only online version. Uh, but if you want to have more information also about this and, and keep up to date with this uh, type of events, uh, the combiomed-conference.org website, you can find uh, more information in there. Uh, in addition to uh, community building, our a lot of our work is also towards supporting the users. And one of the main activities is, are indeed trainings. 
Uh, on our website, we have a training portal that contain um, um, a list of uh, and links to past and upcoming training events, and also um, a description of the training plan of the project. This training portal is accessible also through the EOSC catalog, showing some of the synergies also in service delivery that we are trying to, to, to have with other uh, European initiatives. Uh, in addition to trainings, we, we, give all, we um, provide a list of webinars, a, a repository of webinars that have been a great resource indeed to, to have a, a collection of uh, 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 tutorials and, and also um, presentation from partners of, of the project. And the main focus in this regard of the project is indeed in planning and delivering of courses, uh, both in biomedical and more technical uh, um, topics. Uh, a lot of these, many of these uh, workshops also have been organized in joint uh, collaboration with other projects. An example is the uh, Combiomed the Training Winter School. Uh, we will have an edition, online edition in February of this year, but we uh, organize this event uh, almost every year in collaboration with uh, with the praise and the big relevance also is on um, on trainings and and uh, uh, and uh, yeah and the workshop is uh, on the organization of university based courses uh, with the partner mainly UCL and Sheffield working on this uh, where we are planning to give more HPC oriented uh, trainings on HPC trainings to medical and life science uh, students. Uh, in this regard, though, I would like to spend some few words on a recent work indeed from UCL and Sheffield. Again, the, the idea is to expand this medical student training, enabling biomedical teaching and using of HPC. Uh, recently, UCL Sheffield, in collaboration with Alsace Flight, one uh, associate partner of the project, they've been working on uh, the, the setup of uh, Nucleus Cloud, an HPC education environment that can be an important act project asset. And uh, the idea is also to extend this collaboration and network to other European medical schools. If you want to know more about this, uh, we have a, a page in our news and uh, events uh, uh, page in the website, and there is, where there is also the video of this work presented at SC2020. Uh, the user support also passed through, uh, for example, other activities like uh, uh, providing access and allocation to uh, core uh, project partners. For this, we have set it up a Combiomed allocation service where partners and associate partners of the project can, could request access to uh, partners HPC systems. And in addition of cycles, we also offer uh, dedicated support for the use of this system. Uh, recently, in the regard of the user support, we also set it up a, a free support uh, for scalability of computational biomedicine solution uh, in collaboration with the Zilligo World community. There is a dedicated Slack channel in their Slack uh, uh, workspace regard, uh, to request the support in a scale or uh, porting the, uh, your code, your biomedical code. And we have further plan also to extend the support more into parallelization, optimization of code, and intensified co-design and portings of codes. Um, a large part of the work in, uh, in Combiomed also uh, is uh, related to the development of efficient biomedical solutions. So the application in Combiomed are really important. And we are working in several areas, both on the, the development of new uh, methods, but also in uh, um, improving efficiency and scaling of the application. Here I've listed some of the examples on what we are working, especially now scaling application toward exascale, porting to of codes to GPUs and other uh, hardware, a coupling of multi-scale and multi-physics workflow, coupling of AI HPC, use of VVUQ verification, validation, and certain quantification techniques, and also analysis of in silico trials uh, campaign. Uh, 
Um, all information around the uh, Combiomed applications can be also uh, found in the software app service, again, accessible through the Combiomed website. And uh, we also trying to provide proactive support. So if you want to know more about application or get in contact with some of the developers, you can also contact the email address software at Combiomed.eu. Marco, two minutes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let's, sorry. Uh, just a couple of examples of applications of combined application that are actually been used as more as a service or real real uh, case scenario. So one is a um, well known unfortunate COVID-19 research. Combiomed has uh, been very active in, in this regard, also part of a vast international uh, consortium across Europe and USA. Uh, we have a dedicated page on coronavirus research on our website that I invite you to, to check for having more information of all the different work done in this, uh, in this area. But also success stories are not only related to COVID research. One example of a, a service of a, actually a startup designed, a, born around one of the Combiomed code, Alia, is a LM Biotech. This is a spin-off of the of BSC, and they work around Alia indeed to provide in silico supercomputed and cloud-based uh, solution. Uh, another uh, last example of applications as a service, especially uh, with interfacing with the clinical uh, domain, is the CT2S computational workflow developed by the University of Sheffield. This provides a, a computational tomography uh, analysis. Uh, the, 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 the novelty here is that this HPC-based workflow is accessible to clinician directly for uh, for uh, for use without having to to um, to have to manage the access to HPC and all the complex uh, operation that that require the workflow is is available at the uh, at this address uh, through the Insigno uh, Institute. There are many more applications. Again, I invite you to, to check on the software hub uh, all the, the, the supported Combiomed application. And I wanted just to conclude by pointing last last part of activities we, we are working in Combiomed is on data support. So uh, uh, another important aspect of, of supporting our community is also on data management and data storage. We have a dedicated work package in, in Combiomed to support the data intensive uh, research. And we have been also partnered in uh, uh, other initiative like the DICE proposal within EOSC for the development of a fair, in the fair intensive data transfer workflow. And we are already in discussion with other communities like Lexis to extend the federation of our, our network and, and uh, eventually extend also the federated center of, of this uh, workflow. And with this, I, I conclude, I hope I gave you a, a um, a uh, comprehensive overview of the services that you can uh, find in, within Combiomed. And of course, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Renata, have I missed something in the FNA? No. No, Q &A? no. okay. Then thank you again, Marco. I, I think we'll move on to the, the panel discussion for which I will um, start to show my screen. And just go into, okay. Good, so we are, we're going to hold um, um, now a panel discussion about um, co-design in general or what we, We'll, we'll discuss what we mean with co-design. We have a number of panelists. Um, some of you have already met, but I'd like to introduce them briefly um, in alphabetic order. So, um, Soline, sorry, not I didn't use ladies first on this one. Um, first, we have Edouard Audi. He's the director of the CA Maison de Simulation, and he's the coordinator of EOCUE and the chair of the HPC CUE Council. Then we have Berk Hess from KTH, uh, representing BioExcel. He's a professor of biophysics at KTH, and his role is, is the, as a research developer of the molecular simulation software Gromax. Soline Laforet uh, is from Bull Atos. 
and she's involved in, in cheese. Um, her role at Bull Artists is as collaborative project manager. She's an HPC senior expert and she's involved in application and performance teams uh, within, um, and in, in cheese, she leads the co-design activity. Javier Nieto is um, head of the Advanced Parallel Computing Lab at ATOS, uh, Atos Research and Innovation. And he's also in, a member of the ATOS Scientific Community, community Quantum Computing Track. Um, he's the coordinator of Hidalgo, as you heard earlier. Gavin Pringle from EPCC in Edinburgh is representing Accelerat. He's got a long um, track record in HPC and he's currently an HPC consultant at EPCC. Um, and he's the co-design working group leader within Accelerat. And finally, uh, David uh, Whiffling from LZ in Munich, representing Comp Biomed. He's, his background is in medicine, uh, medicinal chemistry, but since 2020, he's got a position as a computational scientist at LRZ. And in within Comp Biomed 2, he leads the work package on data management and analytics and the task, the route to exascale. Okay. So those are our panelists. What I'm going to do is I will take different orders when we ask questions. Um, we've got a, a number of prepared questions, um, which I'll pose and then, um, we'll let each of the um, panelists answer and then open it up per question to questions from the audience. So the first question or the first theme is, well, what do we mean by co-design? So what are our expectations for interactions between hardware system and software developers that we might cat categorize as co-design? Um, and at what levels of the HPC computing system does core design make more sense for your applications and communities? So I'm going to break the um, alphabetic order and, and go with ladies first on this first question. So Soline, would you like to answer one of those two questions or both? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Great. So. Um, Co-design can be understood at different levels. For example, at the chip design level, we cannot necessarily influence this design, of course, but we can establish strong partnerships with the different suppliers in order to know in advance the future orientations and uh, adapt our future developments and optimization according to these new features. Uh, we can also find co-design at software level. Uh, we have to work with developers to obtain a software stack as uh, adapted as possible to our needs. And in my point of view, it's easier to influence software stacks than influence chip design. So we have to do it. <laughs> and uh, of course, at the end, the design of the cluster is really important. Each element, hardware and or software, will have an impact on application's performance. So to, to conclude, each level is important. And in my point of view, we cannot work on one level without having at least a knowledge of the others. OK, thanks a lot. Then I'll switch back to alphabetic order for this question. Um, Edouard. Would you like to comment? Yes. Uh, hello again, everyone. Yeah, I think co-design is, a, is a, a key issue. And as was already said, it can happen at a uh, at different level. Um, so we all would like to, to co-design the, the chip. But as Solid mentioned, I think we have very little leverage on the, on the chip design. And uh, often uh, the chips are not especially designed for uh, for HPC. They are part of a, a broader scope with uh, AI, gaming, and many things and uh, coming in into play. So it's uh, it's very hard to to have a strong influence. Even though sometimes we can provide a feedback on a vector lines, cache few, and a small stuff that are taken by a hardware maker and. Uh, it's not 100% sure that they take it into account, but there's still some possibility to, to provide uh, feedback. Uh, then, yeah, we can influence, I think, co-design of the, of the global system. I think that's uh, the very important issue. 
uh, when there is a machine procurement, uh, there are some benchmark application and uh, when it's well done, uh, people of application are into the loop and then the design of the of the machine, of the memory amount, of the IO system, the global balance of the of the full machine that will be bought is a, uh, is a key issue for, uh, for many applications. So there, I guess, uh, a good relationship between uh, application developer and people managing the, the procurement is, uh, is an important issue. Uh, and then, as was mentioned by Solin, the, where we can have most influence is on the software stack. And then maybe I would differentiate different levels. So there is a, the low level software and the system and the, and the compiler and the, I would say the whole software development stack, which is a, a very critical issue and is very much needed. So there progress I made uh, uh, very quickly and it's very important to have a good environment for the, for the hardware. And then maybe on a higher level, I think there's also a great deal that can be done on uh, middleware and, and libraries. Uh, for example, there's a lot of uh, middleware developed to try to abstract the architecture uh, from the application developer. And there also we can uh, have a, a lot of influence and collaboration are easier. Maybe framework like Cocos or uh, other system which uh, are a bit platform agnostic and allow people to, to develop uh, software for a variety of architecture, I think is a, a very useful tool and uh, are extremely important to be able to, to have performance portability and also a good coupling with, uh, with library. In ECHO, we work a lot with people developing library for workflow, for linear algebra, uh, to try to have a co-design uh, bet between software, between people developing application and people, uh, I mean, scientific application and user application and people developing a library. Uh, library are often very efficient, very well tuned for, uh, for specific hardware. And so you can try to, to develop a, a full ecosystem where an application can easily uh, use, uh, make use of library and of a recent development made into library. Um, so basically co-design would be interaction between the, I would say a large community with various people to try to adapt best the application to the hardware. And probably doing that also with a long-term perspective is a, a key issue because the hardware is changing fast and uh, we need to have applications that are re reliable and efficient on the long term. Is it well? So Berk, you're, you're coming from the really the, the application development side, you're, you're the research development for the for the Gromax code. Um, how do you see this this question of core design? Um, um, well, there's, yeah, there's many, most aspects have already been been touched. So ideally we want, would want to co-design the hardware as well. And then there's the software stack and the application. So <coughs> uh, molecular simulation in general and Gromax in particular is a bit special and that it doesn't need use much libraries at all. It just uses an, uh, an FFT library, which we usually use FFTW. So we do, we code directly on the, on the hardware almost. So this gives opportunities for, for co-design in the sense of working together with, with, the, with the manufacturers to optimize codes with which we have a lot of interaction with all big manufacturers, Nvidia, AMD, Intel. Um, now also um, with, um, uh, Japan on the, on the new ARM chips there from, uh, right. from uh, Fujitsu. Um, so we've actually also been s somewhat involved, but yeah, as has been mentioned, there's only minor things you can change in the hardware. We have been involved in pushing some things, some minor details on, on GPUs for the for hardware changes that we would need. But of course, I mean, the gaming market is so large there that HPC is not a relevant portion of the market to optimize hardware for, unless you do a specific chip design as yeah, in Japan, for instance, happens where there's a, a lot more of this co-design going on and even in, in yeah in a very early stage to, to design the hardware but i think we're not in a position here yet at least with chips maybe with the new risk five there's more options here um so in our experience things have worked actually out quite well because gromax is a very important code so vendors are very interested in or the manufacturer very interested in in making things run well so we've had uh, quite fruitful uh, activities where um 
different hardware vendors have have optimized uh, Gromax uh, for their platforms, which used to be only kernels, but nowadays is, is, is there's a lot more challenge in moving data around. So you have to be aware of how the hardware works, what, what data paths are fast, slow, where, where there's latencies to, to, to see where you need to have your data, how much of it, and, and these kind of things, which are things one can also figure out oneself as, a, as, a, as an application developer, but that costs a lot of time and effort. So if, if, if vendors can help there, that's of great benefit. I would say that saves us a lot of time. We can focus on the things that are more generally useful in terms of algorithms uh, for all types of hardware and leave the hardware specifics to the, to the vendor. So that's a path that for Gromax has been quite fruitful, although collaborating with vendors has, is sometimes, yeah, has different problematic aspects there, but it can also be very fruitful. So. Thanks. So it's getting more difficult for the following uh, panelists because many topics have already been addressed, but I'll pass on now to Javier. Um, do you have um, different or similar views for, the, for these questions on what, what incorporates, what covers a core design? Well, uh, I think that uh, they didn't leave too much for, for the rest of us, right? But yeah, I mean, I agree with the with the vision that, that, that you have different levels. Um, this part of the hardware, the, the, the software stack and so on. For me, the interesting thing is that the, even in the hardware part, uh, you have also different levels in the sense that, okay, you can talk with the, the with the hardware vendors, you can report to them the kind of benchmarks that you did and how your software worked and maybe discuss how in the future, uh, uh, you could benefit from other uh, features that they are going to include. Uh, um, but also you have, uh, and this is something that is really feasible from, from the uh, centers of excellence uh, part. So you usually we have many HPC centers in the, in the projects, you know, and one thing that is also important is how you build your HPC center in the sense that, um, for example, how you are going to, to organize your network between the nodes, the characteristics of the nodes, if they are going to be um, to include heterogeneous uh, hardware or some concrete devices, uh, in which quantity. Um, this is interesting because I think that the kind of work that we do in these kind of projects can also influence how the future systems are going to, are going to look like, you know. Uh, so um, we could make the difference in the sense that uh, they, they may decide to, to uh, try with different network topologies or with different uh, new devices, you know. Or, so this is the, maybe the, the, the point where we can influence, let's say. Um, also, but of course, you have the part of the software. So for us, it's interesting to see if there is uh, new versions of the libraries, so for example, you may have new MPI operations which now are not blocking the others. And I mean, uh, you, you may have different things and, and a new guidance in OpenMP and things like this, you know, uh, or support for new devices. Uh, that is also interesting. And also in that sense, perhaps it's easier to influence and or at least to talk with them and, and we can learn each other, but yeah, I think these, these are the, the most interesting points from at least from the centers of excellence point of view. So one of the, I think one of the things that I just picked up was, uh, was it's not just about the applications and the application communities, but also the HPC centers and the role they play. So our next two panelists are both from HPC centers. Um, Gavin, you're representing Accelerate, you're, you're in charge of core design within Accelerate. What's your take on these questions? So, um, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with everything that everybody said. The classic definition of core design that hardware and software um, developers work together is uh, somewhat of a fiction. Hardware, large computers will never really uh, bend their hardware towards the will of a slowly applicating uh, people. So, but everybody said that already. I think I've got two points that I could add. First of all, um, the HPC centers have special relationships with the vendors and uh, HPC centers often get early access to new novel platforms. So it's, uh, HPC centers put a lot of exotic boxes underneath people's desks and um, whilst uh, under NDA we can't uh, give access to everybody, certainly within the COEs, uh, EPCC and other HPC centers can can take applications or, or, or small versions of mini apps 
and just uh, which are essentially just the kernels of the applications, and then port them onto these uh, novel cutting edge uh, uh, hardware, just to see how suitable they are, whether the compilers can function, whether the libraries, the vendors supply, whether they're suitable, whether they're typically buggy and we can help them then debug the software they provide. So I think because of this special relationship, we, uh, we, can, we can open the door to application developers at the HPC centers and uh, provide them access to new hardware. And then, uh, uh, for instance, uh, they might be able to switch on flags for uh, FPGA usage or, or, or an ARM GPU or maybe a, a vector card. Um, so that in the future, once these heterogeneous exascale machines come online, then they can just switch this part of their code on and then they, they can exploit it that way. The other thing I wanted to say was, um, if, if there is, is anything, the closest we can get at COEs to co-design, I think would be is uh, via the EPI project. And if we can persuade EPI to take on one or two or more of our, our key applications from each of the COEs, then we can uh, somewhat influence the, the, the direction that EPI take. Right. We can get them onto our, if we can get our applications onto their benchmark suite, I think that would be very beneficial to all the scene. Okay, I know it was flagged that, but before we come to uh, it was discussion point on that, it's also that that last thing you raised is also one of the later questions, and, and it'd be interesting to know if there's well, it links to one of the later questions. Um, um, I, I know that EPI has its own benchmark suites, which may, might reflect some of the applications. But before we go into that, um, I'll pass on to David um, from um, from LRZ in HPC Center in Germany. Um, your your comments and take on the questions, David. Thanks very much, Gaia. Um, I mean, I think nearly everything has, has been said, actually. I mean, I think really um, co-design is such a mutual effort of hardware developers, system integrators, and application developers, also to build future yeah, compute um, systems on also to run the performance software on them. I mean, I think it's involved in really these areas, so software and hardware, as has also been said, actually. and. In combine it, I mean, I think it's very important also um, to, to, I mean, we build a, a benchmark suite also of the combinement codes and to then um, yield optimal performance on, on specific hardware types and, and GPUs and accelerators. And also, um, yeah, we try to, to improve also to the, very much the code performance. We make rigorous code optimizations. I think this is also a very imp important point here. And also with certain hardware code, I mean, we see, of course, our our main um, area on, 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 on software code design as we are um, science-centric uh, center of excellence. But I think also in our case, um, we try to consider different aspects such as chip design, node design, and GPU, CPU ratio, and like that. Also networking, I.O. infrastructure, cooling and power, and that's these things. And I think also an important point is also in, in code design to very much involve the users because um, they also got experience with different codes. And so I think this is also a very important point here to probably to add. And um, so I think this is, yeah, this is what I can add in, in that regard, yeah. Okay, thank you. So Edouard, you have, we'll, we'll, we'll take questions from the panelists first and then, then I'll check with Renata if we've got any questions from the audience. Edouard. Yeah, thank you, Guy. Yeah, I agree with all that had been said. Maybe just uh, another comment on co-design. I think uh, a key issue is also to build a collectively a long-term vision and, and trust within the, the ecosystem. Uh, someone mentioned the, the Japanese uh, Fugaku project, and then they, they had a, a really strong collaboration between hardware vendor and application development. It was really integrated co-design. And they also had a, a long-term vision. Our Japanese colleagues have known for many years in advance that they would get an ARM system with an extended uh, TOFU network. And so they had time to, to get ready. And I think this trend is long-term vision. We should try to, to be developed in, uh, in Europe as, as well. 
uh, I think we don't have enough vision of what will be the next system in, uh, in Europe. We know the EPI, we mentioned it's in the in perspective, but will the next exascale system be based on EPI or will the computing power come mainly from GPU uh, that we, we could debate, so where should we go? And I think this is also true for the software stack that we mentioned. If we're going to rely on library, on a middleware or uh, other software element, uh, application people need to trust that they will be supported on the, on the long run because obviously you don't want to get involved with uh, people developing a library or a middleware if you're not sure that they will continue to have the, the support and from the commission and from other institutions. Uh, to really be able to to carry on with this software and have it on uh, on the long run, so I think a common long term vision and trust in the ecosystem is uh, uh, critical. Good, Renata, because I'm presenting, I can't see the chat at the moment. So, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, there is one from Ivan Spiso. So, do you think? EU ecosystem will be ready in a new future for a vertical co-design approach as a waiver scale by Fer Ferberos. There is a link in the chat as well. So I guess that all panelists can uh, um, maybe see the link. Can someone address this question and answer? Any volunteers? From, well, I, I sort of wonder whether we come back to it when we, we think about the, the the time scales for the ecosystem. But let's make this dynamic. Let's if anybody has a direct comments back. Yeah, I, I had a quick look at the, at the paper. So these, I, I think these kind of endeavors are very interesting. But um, I, I suppose the hardware or the application hardware link would often be quite specific. So you will you get more specific hardware for specific applications, which of course can give major benefits, but makes it less general in such cases. I suppose that's a general issue with HPC is that we want a machine that works for all applications uh, and not optimized for, for one. So this makes it, I think, harder to use such approaches, unfortunately, because it's very interesting. It will give large benefits, but there's, there does seem to be space space for even more than one architecture, I would argue two, two would be good. You can have a memory, large memory optimized case and a, and a latency optimized machine, but uh, even that already seems difficult to achieve, so. Somebody else, any other of the panelists want to comment on, the, on that question from Ivan? Okay, then, then I would move to our next question which is about, um, oops, co-design and we were just talking about HPC in general. So how do we do co-design with the COEs, with HPC in general? But what about really looking towards Exascale, which is part of the, the remit for all the COEs? What are the new challenges for co-design relating to the upcoming Exascale systems and architectures? So I'll... Um, I'm going to reverse the order then, and we'll start with David. So you, people will last last time and the, the first time this time. So David, what what do you think about the, the exascale aspect of all this? Yeah, thanks very much. I think I think there are a lot of challenges also in that regard. I mean, I think especially in the case of accelerators, we get more and more um, different programming models. We get more and more vendors that um, come into the field and. So I think also the time for code optimization increases and probably we need really general programming models that cover our different vendors, different architectures actually. So I think this is a challenge we have on, on the one hand side. And I think also um, scaling on full machines can be also very much challenging. I mean, you know, for example, um, while code such as the LB solver, um, HMLB has very good inter, internal GPU scaling or performance. I think also, for example, molecular dynamics codes show a poor parallelization between GPUs. And I think in that case, for example, also complex workflows can solve that in a, in a certain way um, where different jobs are, a lot of jobs are executed on different nodes and like that, or that are independent in, in a certain way. But also, um, I think also in case of um, 
big full node job, full machine jobs. I mean, you have the problem or can have the problem in, in a certain way that if certain nodes fail and you have a so such a monolithic code. So I think that this can ha happen to, or it can happen that or it may, might happen that the whole, the whole job actually crashes. And so I think this can also probably in a certain way be solved by replicas based uh, complex workflows. But I think this probably can also be addressed or can be certain system software needs to be developed also to handle that in a certain way that if certain um, certain nodes are failing, um, not the whole job crashes in a certain way. So I think this is, could be an, an issue that it has to be solved also. And also um, what, what I be also thinking in combine it is um, how can you compare CPU and GPU runs? I mean, for example, normally you have scaling plots, number of CPUs or cores, um, and then against um, the performance you yield actually. And how do you want to account GPU actually? Um, probably the, some matrix has to be developed or clarified actually. Um, for example, do you compare the flops or like that? Um, if you have a system with different number of CPUs and GPUs, so I think this is important also to clarify. And um, as also has been said a little bit, I mean, if you design a, a hardware based on a, on a certain software, you adapt a certain so hardware to a software. I mean, this probably leads to the fact that um, the hardware is very specific and probably also HPC centers need general purpose systems that um, where a lot of different software from different fields can be run on. I mean, I know, for example, on, in, the, in the molecular dynamics field, I mean, there's Anton developed from the show. This is a massively parallel supercomputer designed for these molecular dynamics simulations, but it's not general purpose anymore. So I think these are questions also that have to be addressed and um, which are also challenges um, to cover actually. Um, how specific uh, does one have want a, a certain hardware? And I think this is these are topics that in my case or in our view need to be co covered actually and um, that are really challenges also in, in, in the direction to the access scale. Yeah. I will misuse my position as, as chair moderate to interject a question. So and yeah. it would be from the applications user point of view Perhaps they're not so interested in how to measure the scalability, but they're only interested in, can I solve new problems and, and, and do I get myself and pro problem solved quicker? So that's just a, a comment. They say, I don't care about the flops or whatever, how you measure it. I just want my results. So maybe that, that's a point. This is really the user, user point of view, actually. Yeah. This is right. So Gavin, Exascale yeah. and co-design. Oh, um... David, you, you, David introduced a lot of points there, and I think I'm just going to broach one of them. It's the uh, um, exascale machines are going to be heterogeneous, and we're going to have accelerators. And so you have to expose as much parallelization in your application as possible. So, um, and I think the main challenge there is persuading application developers to do so. They seem reticent to start programming and OpenCL or, or, or CUDA for GPUs, it, it, it's a bit, it's not as easy as I think computer scientists would have you believe. That, um, I think application scientists are, um, I think OpenACC is a, a, a fantastic leap forward, but it, it still has to be tuned for uh, new accelerators as they come online. But it's still, I still find code owners to be a bit reticent in, in adding new code just to do science that they can already do. I think HPC centers uh, play a key role here and, and that we can, uh, application owners can offload that task onto um, computer scientists in order, and they can work together in, in a co-design fashion, so to speak, uh, software, software, co-design, so that, um, uh, so applications can access to the GPUs and the FPGAs and other external vector units, what have you. That's for me. I think the main challenge is persuading application owners to allow people access to their codes and accelerate and enable enable them for accelerators. 
I'm going to I'm going to break my rule. What I said earlier, I was going to go reverse order, but because you raised that point of application service, I'm going to jump now to uh, to Berk. What? Do you have a, a immediate comment on that aspect or, or the exascale challenge for Gromax? Well, I think the exascale, I mean, the, the, the hardware from the point of view of, of, of Gromax and as it should be for up-to-date applications hasn't changed so much per se because the GPUs we already have since more than a decade and things haven't changed so much except if, if you get more and more cores on both CPUs and GPUs and, and you're getting, yeah, you need to use them, expose even more parallelization as what was already said. But I think for molecular dynamics in particular, as was also already mentioned, but I think for nearly any application to use a significant part of an exascale machine, you need to have some other kind of parallelism than the application itself usually. And yes, you have a fluid dynamics application that can scale out massively. Um, you have to do some ensemble parallelism or other kind of smart, smart tricks. And issues we have been running into, which, which are just getting worse and worse, for instance, are, are job placements. So you, you want fast communicating elements of your, of your calculation within a single simulation to be tightly connected. Whereas if you do ensemble parallelism, which interacts only every so many steps, that can go through slower networks. But these kinds of things are not exposed currently. And there are no handles on this either in, in, um, in middleware there. So this, this is an aspect I think that needs to that needs that needs addressing it rather quick. We're already having issues now. If you have if you run out a large job with many simulations communicating infrequently, that one job gets split over to partitions of the machine, for instance, and this kills kills your performance. So there needs to be awareness of such kind of things, in addition to software being aware of that there are GPUs where they are in, in the node and these kind of things, which is also lacking in many cases. We in Gromax try to do some rudimental things there, but it's also not not very elegant. So these are kind of things that. Uh, we need, but likely many other applications will also need that the access skill to have more awareness of, 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 of the topology of the whole system and then adapt your job to that, which is a, a co-design effort, I would say, because also the, I mean, the, the manufacturer would know how, how these things communicate and what's the best way to set this up. And there has to be someone detecting all this. I mean, in Gromax, we've been doing a lot of this by hand, but this shouldn't be our job to write detect topology detection of your, of your access skill, skill, skill okay. system. So, Lean, that sounded like a, an issue for, for you uh, with your Bull Atos hat on. Um, so, I'm, I'm again, I'm breaking the rules on the question. So, can, do you want to comment on that directly, or, or does that line up, align with what your thoughts are on, on the exascale challenges for core design? Um, yeah, I think it's clear for everyone we are at the turning point. At the past, the hardware choice, choice was very limited. So if your application on with good performance in cluster A, you could have hoped that it will be the same in cluster B, or at least your application run. But tomorrow, it will be less easy. <clears throat> For example, how will I be able to use a new cluster equipped with, uh, for example, AMD GPU? Therefore, my application is skewed over. So, um, in the future, the big challenge is to have an application that is compatible with as many platforms as possible and being as efficient as possible. So I think we will have to make some concessions and to work with uh, uh, software developers. Okay. Guys, sorry to interrupt. There is a comment again on the chat uh, from Ivan Spiso. So uh, regarding the KPI, it keeps what you want to measure. Usually code developers care about time to solution. Computer scientists slash HPC center look to energy to solution and similar KPI. So he makes that comment. Um, I don't know if someone wants to. So, so maybe we roll that in. Um, we've got two more panelists with this question, um, and we'll start with Javier. Um, so, Edouard, you're going to be last in the list. So, so the, the 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 question brought in now is what what are the different KPIs from the application point of view and from the HPC center view when we think about exascale? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's roll true. that I mean... into one. He has a very good point in the sense that, for example, in our case as, as a center of excellence, 
Uh, one of the things that um, is very important to us is the, the capability to scale up of the application, right? Because in the end, that means that you are going to be able to, first of all, be optimal in the sense that the, you, you use the resources of the centers as uh, they are expected to be used. On the other hand, if you are very good with that, uh, you are going to reduce the amount of time you need to, to run simulations, right? Which is always very good for the user because in the end, users only care about the time to run and the simplicity of things uh, because less time to run is less money, <laughs> you know? Also from the point of view of the HPC centers, uh, being more efficient is also less, uh, less uh, energy, which is less money for maintenance as well. And, and even the possibility to have more users into your system running their things. Um, so yes, so it's it's a uh, each person in the ecosystem is going to have his or her own view on uh, the KPIs to look at. You know. Um, so in that sense, it's true. Uh, but from from my point, from my perspective, uh, uh, I'm I'm more worried about the how to make the culture to adapt the culture in such a way that be efficient in general. Um, so for example, um, there was something mentioned before about EPI. So for now, I think that there is a big uncertainty on how the new exascale systems are going to be. We don't even have uh, some pre exascale systems running that we can test, uh, you know, benchmark uh, uh, with uh, very long runs of uh, large applications and so on. And uh, this is challenging in the sense that I don't know right now exactly what I should adapt in my code because whatever adaptation I make could be useless in the future, you know? And maybe when you have very big applications with a, a long history, like um, yeah, Growmax or other CFD simulation tools, okay, you have a very large community and you are going to have a lot of people that could be doing their own benchmarks and doing maybe modifications here and there, testing some code. But when you have codes that perhaps don't have so large community, it becomes much more complicated. Because you have to very to concentrate your efforts in the code design part and on the adaptation part, okay, and that is uh, very challenging, uh, I would say, at least from from my perspective. Okay, thanks, Javier. So, Edouard, you get the chance to uh, last comments on on this question, but there are more questions coming up. So okay, maybe just so as I mentioned, uh, there are many uh, technical challenges that have been mentioned already extreme scalability, diversity of hardware. And I think the key issue is what was just mentioned about performance portability and being able to have applications that can be carried on uh, several generation or several kinds of, uh, of hardware. Maybe another aspect of uh, exascale that we could mention is that uh, very likely extremely large exascale system will uh, um, provoke a new new usage of HPC, and there is a more and more importance of data and of copying of HPC with the data analytics and more complex uh, workload. So I so this raises also a technical question and also uh, maybe um, a, a rethinking in within the community of how they can use exascale system and how to work with them and how to. To really take benefits of the new usage that are allowed by this uh, new exascale system and especially on the data centric and uh, aspect of the workloads that can be done on, uh, on this large machine. Okay, great. So next question or set of questions. Um, it's more now- uh, Sorry, sorry oh, there is another, another question. Oh, sorry, I forgot, yes, please. Yes, yeah, sorry, there is another question in the question and answers from Piero Lanucara. So he mentions, it seems quite interesting for co-design towards exascale, the connection with resiliency, fault tolerance, is already commented by one of the panelists. Should this underline from a general perspective or co-design and resiliency will remain different branches of investigation? Can any one of the panelists maybe say a few words about that? Or yeah, I can say something if you it will. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So within Echo, we we work a bit on uh, on resiliency uh, with uh, an application called FTI. It's a fault tolerance interface, and actually, it's very linked to. Um, 
what I said before about uh, in situ data analysis and data treatment, because if you're able to restart an application, you have the problem of, of storing the data. And so you can use them to for restarting, or you can also uh, use them to do uh, in situ uh, data analytics. Um, so the issue is um, resiliency is that if you have an extre extremely large system, there's a high probability uh, that uh, at some point when you do a long simulation, one part of the system will fail and that you will have to restart your application from a, from a failure. Uh, so there have been a lot of, of work around this. But up to now, it's not something that is uh, really happening. Even if you do uh, a very, very large runs, uh, mean time before failure of large system uh, is quite high and it's quite resilient. Uh, so I would say with, for the moment with normal restart procedure, uh, you don't really need to implement this uh, fault uh, tolerant, uh, which are quite complex. Uh, so this fault tolerance library, and I mean, I don't know how it will be on an uh, extremely large system, I mean, even larger system. But for the moment, the number of nodes has not increased so much. Uh, they are more powerful and um, I'm not a hardware specialist, but uh, I don't see this happening in the in the near future. The fact that uh, the system would uh, break uh, with a high probability within your simulation time. Okay, that's that's interesting because uh, I recall in the ETP for HPC strategic research agenda discussions a few years back, um, when we talked about well things are moving towards exascale, everybody was saying well yeah they'll break all the time. The, the machines are so big that the, there'll always be faults, there'll always be no, um, goers going down, so resiliency and fault tolerance is a major issue. Um, but what you've just said as well, doesn't seem to be, it's, we're looking at it, but it's not yet a, a, a key, key critical point. Does anybody agree, disagree with that from the panel? From Maybe from the HPC centers, Gavin or David, what are, what are you seeing? Um, so um, I think the, the machines that haven't been built yet, the exascale machines, will definitely have issues with um, uh, faulty parts. And I think the ETP for HPC was right in saying that that will be the case. I think currently we're, 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 um, we're, we're quite comfortable um, and perhaps we, we should be a bit more uh, aware of it. I think it's definitely a co-design issue. I, I think it would be terrific if hardware can notify applications that there is an issue and trigger a, a, a restart uh, dump um, before the node goes down, perhaps right. a temperature uh, issue. So yeah, that'd be very beneficial. I, I don't think I've heard of that. Um, but there was, there was talks yesterday uh, as part of this conference about resilience, which I thought were very interesting. But, um, uh, uh, redundant, they're running two simulations concurrently. Um, okay. Yeah, no, definitely an issue, uh, yeah. in the future, I think, but not currently. David, do you yeah. want to comment? Yeah, if I may add anything, I mean, I think it's it's really an issue. I mean, we also at LSC, we, we know that. I mean, we have for over 6,000 nodes, um, and we had jobs, or some, some jobs also within Comparamed, and I think it's it can be an issue. and. Um, I think there are, if you go to higher and higher scales, I mean, we really need some some software development in that regard, um, because otherwise we really really get problems and to scale up to that to to that to that um, through the extra scale really. So I think there is really need, and I also think this, that this is also can be covered, covered and should be covered also in co-design. Uh, or within core design, and um, I think this is good to, to continue in that regard. Great. Any other comments before we move on or questions from the audience? And thank you very much for that question. That, that was raised some very important points. No more questions, thanks. Okay. So, I've, uh, the, the next set of questions, or a bunch of them, where you can answer as, as you wish, it's, it's, it's really about uh, what's being planned in the CUEs. So what are the CUEs doing at the moment? Um, are they included in the project plans for your individual CUEs? And do we think there are, th there are things that um, 
that we can identify commonalities between core design work, at least in certain applications fields, so different applications codes in different fields? Um, or do we think there are ways to, um, what, what are our approaches for doing collaboration on core design between the CUEs, the exascale pilots and technology development projects, which may be like the FE, FET HPC projects or, or also EPI. So it's what, what, what are the, I guess if I summarize that question, it's what are the options are you already thinking about in your CUEs and where can we go forward? Um, I know that we've got a couple of people with core design activities specifically represented here. So let's start with Soline. What, what's what's um, Chi's doing on, on core design? Um, in Chi's project, uh, there is a task dedicated to core design activities. <clears throat> uh, the earth solid domain is a huge and vast domain with very various problematic. So, we, we have worked to find some behaviors and kernels which are common in this field. And uh, by working on it, we can provide some tips for uh, this community. Um, I think in more general way, we can benefit from studies made in other fields. Indeed, many physical problems can be described in similar way and use the same algorithm approach. So, yes, we, we work um, to, to, to give some guidelines. Okay. To, Gavin, you're the co-design co working group leader in Accelerate. What's, what's going on in Accelerate? So, um, we have launched a co-design co service is now live on the Accelerat website. So we offer that not just to our, uh, 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 to our Accelerat partners, but also to external clients if they want to exploit that. So, and that involves, um, we have eight tasks, um, uh, data analytics, data management. We've got a test lab for emerging technologies and HPC division. We have uh, validation and benchmarking suites. We have node level optimization and internode optimization, and finally core design. And altogether, we have this working group which uh, cross cuts across uh, these eight tasks. Um, and I, I coordinate the, that working group. And um, so in essence, uh, we would take a, 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 an application or a small version of that application. And we would, and the, the, the owner might say, I'm particularly interested in uh, I don't know, vector cards. And so we would pass this to one of our partners who has access to this and then they would port it and then they would report back and say, uh, I don't know, the current libraries are out of date or there's a bug in the compiler or your code is not standard or, or you need to, uh, we can introduce this code on your behalf. And of course, Accelerate would also lean on pop if we didn't have the effort in order to, to help them out. So it's an integral part of our project plan. It's not only a task and a working group, but an active, service. And, and regarding one of the other questions on the slide there, um, the synergies and com uh, commonalities, for me that would be numerical libraries such as Scalypack and, and Petsy. We're very keen to see uh, these commonly, commonly used uh, libraries uh, across a wide range of applications which are GPU enabled. Not just GPU enabled but actually optimized and there's one thing that they can use them but if they use them so poorly that they're and they slow your code down. Then, um, and so I, I'm very happy to see there's quite a lot of um, uh, horizon money funding projects in order to, to help with these, which is predominantly, uh, let's be honest, an American uh, uh, dominated field. Okay, thank you. Um, Berg, do you have some, what, are, what do you have activities in BioXL on, on core design or? Um, well, in the BioXL, description of work. I don't think we explicitly wrote things there. So Gromax has several co-design activities, as I mentioned, but right. BioXL includes a lot of other things about improving code quality and, and reach outreach and such kind of things that there's no space, I think, to, to promise, direct and investigate co-design work explicitly okay. as, as tasks there, because it's quite an undertaking. 
looking to do a co-design effort and also takes takes a quite a long amount of time but i think it it, it it will be necessary to have codes running at the exascale so this needs to be lo looked into maybe for the next funding period um, we should do such things but i suppose especially for biomolecular things which are biomolecular systems are small it would always come at the ensemble level so at workflows and these kind of things which should be um, targeting the exascale so okay. that's also what we're already looking into we've um, got a, a few a couple more questions coming up we're, we're running out of time a bit so i would at this point ask if there are any questions on this on what the series are doing and how they may collaborate or may collaborate with other um projects if there are any questions from the audience or if the pan other panelists that haven't yet responded want to comment so renata have we got any questions or comments from the audience no not for the moment okay no. anybody from the panelists wants to comment further on this before i um oh javier yeah. Yeah, from myself, for example, in the case of Hidalgo, we, we have concrete uh, concrete task for the part of co-design. Uh, also, we have another one which has to do with future technologies that somehow is also related. But uh, for me, the um, interesting thing with respect to the other centers of excellence is that um, I think that we have some software, um, some tools, for example, the ones which are for agent-based simulations that are not so uh, common with the rest of the center of, of excellence. So whatever we do there is something that we could share. But also from our side, um, we, we use other tools like Open Foam, which are important for us, and centers of excellence like Accelerat. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they are doing some work with respect to co-design with, with uh, Open Foam that uh, from our side it would be very interesting to know the things that they do and to, to understand about their, their results. So we can in maybe incorporate something in order to optimize from our side. Javier, we actually dropped open foam uh, in the first year. But the, <laughs> the foam, uh, which uh, Ivan Spiso, I think, is in the audience, um, Exafoam started in January, uh, and that's specifically looking at, uh, I think, introduce, uh, improving Petsy GPU utilization for open foam. So, Renata, I think we had some participants raise their hand. Um... We can either give them the um, option to, to re phrase their question themselves or they can put it in the chat. I, but I don't at the moment in my list see who that was. I can only see that David was raising the hand. Yeah. So okay. Just, yeah, I just wanted to add um, the, 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 the co designer activities going on in Combiomet. I mean, we have the task group to the X scale within Combiomet. I mean, we have a, a lot of efforts here. I mean, we have a different, uh, a lot of testing systems within the combined partners. We, we try to, to handle them and in a certain way, um, yeah, provide them to our partners. Um, and I mean, we have also a combined benchmarks we to determine the scaling and performance of our codes on the different architectures. And we have monolithic codes, as I have said, Palabos, Simos, Ali, and Himal B. And also a set of molecular dynamic codes such as Chromex, NMD, Ember, OpenMM, which are all used, can be used by the pre scale workflow back. And I mean, also we will work very, very much together with the application developers. Um, we will perform rigorous code optimization supporting to different architectures. And I think one important point is also to characterize the hardware requirements of the software because I mean, we will, for example, determine how many CPU cores, GPUs of which type are needed per node, also to find the best GPU-CPU ratio. Also, then very important also to see which memory size type and bandwidth as well as, well as network bandwidth with this required to SQL and bottlenecks. I mean, I think these are important things here that are going on here in Combiomet to find the best hardware composition for a given set of software and also to find a balance between hardware and software. That means also to see if a certain hardware is needed for a certain software or it's just waste of money or like that. So I think these are these are things going on here in Combiomet and we are pushing that very much forward to get our codes towards the exascale actually. So I think that what you were just describing leads into this yeah. further question. Very this much true, so. yeah. um, true, yeah. Renata, you may have a question, but 
but I, yes. I'll pause this so question thought, now and then we we can link the question so so, so the question so there is yeah, there on. is a comment yeah. from Ivan just uh, maybe you can continue with that and then maybe I can give Ivan the the option to talk because he wants to maybe give a little bit more uh, details about the exafoam oh, continuing okay. with the comments that Gavin was making so if that everybody is okay whenever you finish I'll, I'll give him the floor and talk okay so let me let me raise the next question it may be relevant for exafoam or, or other aspects I think the, the issue is that we know um, we're going to be getting European exascale systems or there will be Euro HPC exascale systems we know that the the development times are tight particularly for the EPI based ones um, so the question is, how are the CUEs going to meet the challenge of providing optimized applications for those systems once they're available? Um, now, you may say, well, actually, the CUE finishes before those systems will be available, but I think many of you will be hoping for the next instantiation of your CUE. So if it's not a question to you, it's a question to your next instantiation. So... Um, Maybe we could start with Exaform and say, well, how is Exaform going to make sure that OpenForm can actually go Exascale? Um, Gavin mentioned it. Uh, and so, it, Renat, can you give uh, um, give the right to speak to Ivan? Hello, do you hear me? Yeah, we yes. hear Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, Thanks for the uh, for raising the question. Uh, just uh, very very quick introduction to Exaform. Exaform is a consortium consisting of well balanced group of experts to work on the co-design of OpenForm to target pre and exascaling HPC architecture. It has been funded under the Euro HPC uh, 03 uh, call. Uh, we are going to have a kickoff uh, very soon, 1st of April, and the project will uh, uh, continue for three years. We are targeting in uh, the core industrial software code for extreme scale computing environment and application. And uh, the consortium is done by almost the main developer of the OpenForm community, from ESI to Zap, Zagreb, Wiki, Damstad, and, uh, and University of Minho, Portugal. We have also HPC Center. There are Cineca, WACT as deputy leader, there is BSC, there is also HLRS, and there is N2. Uh, so there is a variety of... of uh, most of the vendor from Intel, ARM, NVIDIA, uh, other uh, HPC center outside from EU, and uh, also, uh, uh, for example, uh, external library. We have also PC team on board. We are working, or we are already working on a plugin open form with PC library, and then we are for the moment exploring GPU capabilities. That's uh, the, the concept. Uh, so, uh, what is the, the main challenge to exploit uh, efficiency and fully the current involving HPC hardware and middleware ecosystem with open form? and seek synergies with expert open source center of knowledge, including also we are going, we have a task for a new algorithm, also development, a new mem parallel method as well. So our target is to improve industrial software and code based on open form technology for industrial users to fully exploit the new capability. Just uh, to conclude, we have uh, two main let's say, work package. One work package is the uh, evolutionary, where we are going to plug in, to plug in a new feature in OpenFORM. Second uh, work package parallel is uh, the refactoring, where we are going to rewrite the basic kernel of OpenFORM in a real co-design fashion. 
this is what we would like to let's say to, 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 to target at so we want to discuss together with the other vendor new data structure virtualization uh, memory access and so on uh, uh, that's enough i think i could talk for one hour about the easy model maybe you can put a link in the chat and, and otherwise i would say hidalgo exaform exaform hidalgo you've now met so it sounds as though there'd be interesting collaboration we we're in some sense running out of time i will keep my wrap up very short because i think it's more interesting to hear about your views on some of these questions um so going through the panel um maybe some very short statements now uh, about this this um, issue of how are you going to get your coe applications onto x scale let's start with with burke from um Gromax. um so i think i think i already mentioned this so in bio excel where where well I, actually i mean there are multiple levels so i i would say we hope to get an order of magnitude per application um, old-fashioned scaling itself, including improvement in hardware, and then we should get an order of magnitude from Ensemble, or maybe more from that as well. And then um, there's also, well, there's yeah, and then and, and then there's wor workflow in terms of um, that in in bio applications, you always are looking at multiple proteins, multiple mutation, multiple drugs. So there's a lot of parallelization there as well. So this on top will easily get us to to extra scale. It's mainly a question of how efficient and for how small problem size or how short time to, to, to solution if a pharmaceutical company wants a quick time to solution. So um, there's a lot more than applications scaling itself in terms of ensembles, I'd say that's... So Edouard, for the energy applications, you have a number, You I know you're working on middleware, you're working on libraries, but will will is, is will ex complex workflows, ensemble predictions be also your way forward to be able to optimize for these new machines? Yeah, so we are definitely working on uh, ensemble run and for some of our application, especially Meteor for Energy, it's, uh, it's a key issue because we want to do a large statistic on a very large simulation. So ensemble run is, a, is an important issue. And for all our um, a key uh, application sector, we have a, a target application that we believe would be ready for, uh, for exascale either by doing ensemble run or by doing a very large uh, simulation. It, it depends a bit on the, on the kind of, uh, on the specific field. Some people will be more willing to do a large ensemble run or do uh, uh, explore a parameter space. And for some other uh, scientific domain, it's more uh, a unique, extremely large uh, simulation. And so we are getting ready for that. And I would say for two aspects, for doing the simulation and also for doing the, the treatment and data analysis of the simulation, because if you just do the run and don't do any analysis, uh, you do very poor science. And uh, we believe it's also a, a key issue because if you do an extremely large run, you're very likely to have a extremely large data set and managing and uh, extracting science from this data set is also uh, an issue and we are trying to to get ready for that also okay so lean what's what's cheese doing to make sure its apps can run on the on the upcoming systems um, will you meet that challenge for <laughs> exascale um, system like lumi or leonardo we have the chance to well known the expected system and we can work in advance to adapt our application to this new hardware, for example, by working on GPU porting. And um, I, I think we have um, several applications already uh, ready. For, okay. uh, yes. Sounds good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Javier? What about Hidalgo? Hey, uh, from our side, um, I think that in in, uh, in a couple of uh, pilots, maybe the scale of our applications is not so high in order to really um, fulfill a full exascale system. Still, with ensemble runs, we can get a very good scalability. But for example, with the one about the social networks, uh, we think that the, we can get a very good scalability. Uh, 
especially because again, I mean, in, in, in all our cases, you need to do ensemble runs. And, and uh, in this concrete case, uh, that each run is quite big, uh, it could be possible, right? So we are working in that direction. And also um, we are interested in uh, taking a look at the uh, characteristics and features of uh, EPI, you know? So we understand that the, at least one of the future European SSK systems is, is going to, to bring this processor. And therefore it's interesting for us to uh, try to port at least some code, you know? So uh, in the future you could say, okay, look, we were testing this. We have some code that could take advantage of some of these new features. And, and maybe then in the future to do many more developments in that, uh, in that area. I, I don't know if, Renato, if there's questions, comments, let me know. I, I just used the opportunity for what, what Javier just sent was to, to link to EPI, to our, actually the very final question, but I know I'm running out of time. It was about to what extent can full-blown applications really do co-design with processor development? And we, we touched on that earlier. Um, we touched on benchmark suites, and, and I think we know that EPI does have a set of benchmark codes. I'm not sure to what extent they're actually kernels or micro kernels, or the, yeah, representative kernels. Um, but if we really, uh, we know that the, the, the European Commission is, has a, as a key point of, of expecting co-design between the CUEs and, and the process developments. So in that sense, do we have to think about expectation management? Um, what, and I don't know if we got any processor developers, technology developers in the audience, what are the limitations on on, on, on doing full-blown application code design with processor development? Complicated questions, but anybody wants to comment or, or, or respond to this, to these points? Javier, since you raised it, do you want to comment further? I'll pick on people if nobody volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the issues I see is that, uh, okay, it seems that they have uh, some simulator that you can use, you know, in order to, to do some benchmark with, and at least to test that your code is working, okay? So in that sense, it's very limited because you don't have a real system. So you don't know if things are going really to work, if they will be optimal. Uh, it's, it's very, very complicated. So it's just a guess you, <laughs> you do in the air almost. And then until you have the, the system, it won't be possible really to, to, to see if things are going to, to work as you were expecting. So that expectation management uh, is really needed, I think, <laughs> in the sense that, um, okay, maybe there will be applications that are really to, able to, to, to use in a huge way these exascale systems, but I don't think that we will have applications that are really able to extract the best power of the, these new systems. You know, this, this is going to be really difficult until we have them at least for some time. Maybe you can do something before the systems are in place, but it's very, very difficult and very challenging to, to have some production code that could really uh, do the, the best of it, you know. Okay, thanks. Anybody else on the panel want to comment? Gavin, maybe, I think you mentioned this, this issue a few minutes ago. Okay, good. Renata, do we have qu questions from the, the audience? No, only the comment from Ivan that he will share um, the slides uh, privately and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, all attendees will uh, receive these uh, the slides okay. from Exaphone. Okay. Good, then I would like to thank all our panelists for your time and for your input and for thinking dynamically on the spot, being put on the spot. Um, thank you very much for your participation. Um, I thought it was, well, I thought it was really very interesting. I hope that's true for the audience as well. I did actually make some notes, but I don't think I'm, I've got that much time. Well, I've got three minute warning coming up. So so relating to the, the panel, I mean, I think we, we discussed, yep, co-design is feasible with the applications. We should be doing it with the software stack in particular, looking at development environments, middleware, overall system. Um, code op optimization with vendors is a key issue. Um, and that the 
some of the HPC centers involved in CUEs have the possibility to look at innovative uh, systems. Uh, we talked about the need for a long-term vision to make sure that applications needs are being reflected in what's being developed. Um, we looked, we talked about the fact that the exascale systems are coming are going to be heterogeneous and the accelerators, there will be multiple types of accelerators and we need to think about performance portability. And then there was an important point brought up with resiliency and fault tolerance when we go to real exascale. Um, Co-design cool work for the CUEs, important aspects are also to take up algorithms, numerical libraries, um, and, and one of the other aspects that was brought up often was that we we should be we will expect to be going to complex workflows and ensemble predictions to make use of the big systems. I would like to um, remind people um, participating that in the chat we posted a questionnaire to give to ask you to give us spend five minutes time giving us some feedback about the workshop that is still in the chat please go and have a look at that um otherwise i think the thing to say is we had a lot of a number of presentations from the series before our panel discussion uh, and you saw the wide range of uh, activities and services and offerings from the series there's lots more information on the hpc coe website so i would recommend you go and have a look at that um, and if you want more interaction get in touch with Focus CUE, get in touch with, with us via the website, get in touch directly with the CUEs. Um, Focus CUE is there to try and help interaction with all of the CUEs. Um, so please have a look at the web page. If you've got other questions, do, do get back to us. And with that, I give myself a one minute warning, but I didn't have anything more to say at this point. Thank you for all the attendees for, for taking part and thank you for all the presenters and the panelists. Thank you very much. Renata, any last logistics comments or moderator comments from you? Um, no, just to remind all attendees that um, the recordings of this session will be on the High Peak YouTube channel. It will be available as uh, Guy said at the beginning. And I also would like to thank you all the speakers and also Guy for you to uh, organize all this session. And uh, I hope that all the attendees, we will see them again in future events from Focus UE. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you, bye.